Okay. I think, I think we're live. I hope we're live. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just start talking. <laughs> Someone can tell us if we're not. I guess I can look uh, yeah, please, like, please, am I live? Tell us if we are not live. Um, Let us know if you can't see us. Where's the pop-out chat again? Okay. Um, okay. Rebecca says we're good. Okay, great. We're, we're doing it. All right. Perfect. <laughs> So hello everyone for our second ever Drunk Science. Thank you so much for joining. We are back with Imogene Cancellari. Thank you so much for joining. Imogene, you were amazing yeah. last week. We talked for three hours and I literally did not even realize we were talking for that long until my boyfriend was like, can, can we go to bed? And I was like, oops, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> Yeah, it was like 2 a.m., almost 2 a.m. by the time I got to bed, and it just did not feel late. So uh, hopefully yeah. everyone else uh, had fun, and we'll re-wash, rinse, repeat here tonight. Yes. Um, so I thought tonight for a little mix-up, we are going to take a large swig of our drink <laughs> rather than shots, because last last time killed me. What um, are you drinking? I am drinking... What kind of one? Pinot Noir. This is a mm, What are you doing? I, I made a Kentucky Mule. What is a Kentucky Mule? So it's bourbon and ginger beer and a bunch of lime juice and a bunch of mint from my little mini oh, garden. So, so good. See, so yeah, it's the first one of the season. <laughs> all right. All right. I'm ready. Okay. So everyone, if you're drinking along, please cheers with us. What should we cheers to? uh fucking surviving another week in quarantine fuck yeah <laughs> all right okay ready cheers, cheers. <laughs> not bad can't oh, like oh, swig. i'm already gonna have mint in my teeth i know it <laughs> note yourself when you muddle it don't chop it first guys when you what like when you muddle it, it's like when you make these drinks you want to get the oils from um the the mint into the drink so you take yeah. like a like basically a mortar and pestle and you want to grind it down in the bottom of the glass so it releases the oils that makes sense Super i did tasty. not see clearly i have not made any cocktails and i just made myself wine i mean cocktails are really pretty in theory but it's kind of hard to like have a conversation and be like uh-huh 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 when you have like you know a small tree in I your realized face what happened last time is i was asking you so many questions that you didn't have time to like take drinks so i was just grilling you i was like hey you tell me everything oh no i drank enough <laughs> <laughs> Um, so today I thought we would touch on some things that we didn't get to last time. Okay. Or maybe we got to them and I was too drunk and don't even remember, but they were fun to talk about anyway. Um, so a couple of things for the viewers, just a little bit of an outline and the outline can totally change slash will probably change, but here's kind of what I'm thinking. Um, I want to talk about being women in science. Um, I want to talk about the weirdest thing you've done for science and the craziest thing you've done for science. And I feel like by the time we're done with that, it's going to be like 8 p.m. and we're going to be hammered. Well, 8 p.m. my time. Okay. I like it. That works for me. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so let's, how about let's couch them. So let's start talking about one of the fun things and then women in science can be in the middle because that's going to be, I need alcohol before I talk about that, to be honest. Yeah, fair enough. Um, and then we'll get to the other thing. And viewers, if you have questions, I promise we are going to be better about answering questions. Yeah, I'm type them in. <laughs> we're amazing last time. And um, we just got, I got to invest in the conversation to really check my messages. So... Well, I talked a lot last time right off the bat. So why don't we just trade spots and you can summarize your research. We're talking about fun stuff. I want to hear, sure. I don't know like anything really about what you're doing. So, okay, cool. Um, so I study stars, I study the universe. Um, and I focus on supernova, which are dying stars, um, okay. and or dead already. Okay. So these are really massive stars that have run out of basically energy and the ability to fuse elements in their core. And so stars live by fusing elements and okay. these stars just can't manage to fuse the iron and the heavy elements um, at that point in time. And so what happens um, for the types of stars that I study, which are, I can talk about the other ones in a minute, but the massive stars, they collapse and then they explode. Whoa, okay. And so what you're left with often is either a neutron star or a black hole. So a black hole is actually the result of a supernova. 
Okay. Um, that doesn't always happen. There are some really massive stars, like think like 40 solar, so 40 times the mass of our sun or like a hundred times the mass of our sun. And that's just a star. Yeah, that's just like a normal, just like that's what stars, they can get that big. I remember when I learned that and I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I had no idea. I thought it was yeah. just planets that were really big. So our star is like kind of small, actually. It's a one solar mass star. The stars right. that I study are 10 to 20 to 30 solar masses. And how far away are these uh, stars from our solar system? So like Betelgeuse is about 500 light years away. So it's far, but on a universal scale, it's actually not that far. I mean, Rebecca, who is one of our mods, who's amazing and helped us set this up, she <laughs> studies things that are at early redshift, which is, I mean, I don't even know the number of light years far away. Rebecca, you can probably say that in the chat. It's like, so the things that I, to change like scales, the things that I look at are redshift 0.2. The things that she looks at are redshift like six or seven or okay. eight. so these things are at the beginning of the universe there were these really 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 massive stars think like 500 a thousand times the mass of our sun and they would immediately okay. explode as supernova and so that's actually one of the things i'm interested in is early universe supernova um wild yeah no it's crazy but um one of the things like my current research project i'm kind of hopping between two because i can't I can't decide. I'm like, I want stars. I want all the stars. Um, right. One of them is to use the big supernova to measure the rate of the expansion of the universe. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So we know the universe is expanding due to dark energy. Okay. So I did not know that. So you're going to, we're going to put a pin in that. And you're going to come back and okay, explain yes. that. Well, actually, that's okay. some shit. Yeah. No, it's okay. So <laughs> back in like, the early nine or yeah, the early 1900s, okay. Hubble mm -hmm. and um, a variety of other people came together and basically mapped out distances to stars and galaxies. And they found when they sort of plotted distance, um, they found that further away stars were moving away mm -hmm. more quickly than closer stars to us. Wow. Okay. okay. It, it was galaxies, it wasn't stars, but that's kind of okay. what you're thinking is things far away it, are moving uh, uh, along with the universe. And so the universe is expanding. It's not stagnant. Okay. And then dark energy was discovered in the early, to, it, was, it was really the late 1900s. So like 1987, 1990. And mm -hmm. we actually learned that galaxies that are farther away are expanding faster than galaxies close to us. And so okay. there's something that is pushing our universe to accelerate its expansion. It's expanding faster and faster and faster as time continues. Okay. And so that's, that's what, that's what dark energy is. Dark energy is the stuff that fuels that expansion. And that's so wild. I am, theoretically trying to understand what that is and how fast the universe is expanding. Okay. So two questions. The first yeah. is how come, so I, I understand that if, you know, galaxy galaxies, right. That are galaxies that are farther away from us are expanding more rapidly than galaxies that are closer to us. Right. Why why is our galaxy not subjected to that same pull? Is it a matter of like, is dark energy um, like centrally located? Like as in, if you think of like, you know, a giant map, you know, somewhere way far out, is there a source of dark energy that's essentially like a ball like this that's pulling them and it's pulling them faster because they are closer than we are. Right. Is that, I mean, so, is that, I don't know. I don't even know if that's right. No, that, no, right this is a good question. And this, honestly, it's kind of like when we thought the earth was the center of the solar system. Right. So it's like, is everything around us happening with us at the center? And the answer is no. Right. Um, even the sun isn't the center. There's a center of mass very close to the sun. And because the sun is so massive, okay. it is there and things happen around the sun. And so that's kind of like, you know, are we the center of the universe? And the answer is no, the expansion doesn't start with us and then 
um, uniformly kind of distribute throughout the universe. We are, the universe is isotropic, which is a really mm -hmm. complicated way of saying, um, we treat the universe like it's the same everywhere. And okay. we are not necessarily in the center of the universe, right? We're not in the center of our galaxy. We are in a, you know, off to the side in our galaxy. Mm -hmm. So a visual that I like to use here is if you picture a loaf of bread and there's a bunch of raisins in the bread, mm -hmm. no matter where the raisins are distributed, as the bread, like, I don't know, gets larger, like inflates. Like when you're baking it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you bake, yeah, there's, exactly. Um, when you bake it, the raisins get farther and farther apart. Right, right. And so the space itself, the like rye or whatever the bread is made of itself is expanding, pushing those raisins away. Okay. And so those raisins are like our galaxies. That's cool. Okay. That, that makes it really, that's an easy digestible metaphor. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's hard because you kind of have to think about, are we, and the, the weird thing about the raisin bread analogy, in my opinion, is you have to think of what is the raisin brand nestled in, like it's in three-dimensional space, right? So where right. is our universe? Right. And that's kind of where you get into, at least I like start to think about, well, we have to remember that the universe is flat which means, and that's very hard to think about as well. Like, does that mean it's nestled between two things? Is it expanding forever? What does that necessarily mean? And the only way I can really think about it is if you, if you, oh, I have a globe here. <gasps> this is great. I can give it, a, oh, this is so cool. Okay. So if you have a globe and you draw a triangle on this globe like that, right? Okay. The angles of the triangle do not add up to 180. They add up to more than 180, right? Because there are these little like concave or convex um, mm -hmm. angles. Right. And so that is called in math terms, non-Euclidean geometry, which basically all it means is that a normal triangle, the angles add up to 180 degrees. Right. This triangle, it does not. Right. So we talk stuff. about... Exactly. Yes. Okay. And so when we talk about the shape or the geometry of the universe, the analogy that we use is that if we were in a spaceship and we were kind of chugging along in the universe and we met two other spaceships and we shown, shown, sh yeah, shown light beams at the other spaceships, they would equal 180 degrees if we were in a triangle. Okay. That's what you're saying. That makes sense really the only way that I know how to picture even just a bit of what a flat universe is. Um, and so kind of to go back to what I do is I'm trying to understand in that flat universe, how fast distant galaxies are expanding with okay. space mm -hmm. and using supernova to do that. So supernova are actually the, one of the biggest tools that astronomers have to try to understand the expansion of the universe, which I think okay. is so cool. That's wild. I will stop talking about No, it's amazing. I'm like completely like, I think I have like my resting bitch face on because I'm just like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Like really, really into it. No, it's <laughs> hard. It's hard to... Go ahead. Go ahead. And I, was like, I feel like a bold lip is a bad choice because I'm just like <laughs> really into this right now. No, dude, it's perfect. Um, and so I guess my follow-up question to that is, so for supernova, they are there. So when the star collapses. Yes. And the leftover is. You know that the collapse happens in like a second. Imagine a 100 or even a 50 solar mass star. How? Like, I don't, I don't know. It. It's like, it's crazy. It's, it's, but it's not, I mean, it's energy based, right? So, I mean, like, it's, yeah. it's not like a heat. It's not like we just popped it because it got too hot. It's just, it's energy. No, oh, wait, we didn't, we didn't get to, yeah. No, it just, what happens is in the last like stages of the star. So we have in a normal star, it fuses hydrogen at the very beginning and it's just kind of like chugging along and then it fuses helium and then it fuses carbon and nitrogen and oxygen. And it starts fusing heavier and heavier elements. If you're going down the periodic table, it's just like one after the other elements. 
Whoa. Okay. And so when she it came notes. I know, no, I, I know. I'm like <laughs> trying not to get too technical, but I just, it's, it's. So no, go for it. I love it. So when it gets to a certain point, which is iron or a little bit actually before iron, depending on the mass, the star is like, fuck, I can't fuse this. I can't jack up my temperatures high enough in the core to actually be able to fuse this. Okay. And so what happens is, so back up for a second, let's talk about like what a star is, how a star just kind of like chugs along in its life. There are two main pressures or forces that we care about. The first one is radiation pressure. And so radiation mm -hmm. pressure is made from fusion and all that is, is just photons, light streaming out of the star. So the, our sunlight, the light that like hits our like, you know, hands and feet, that is photons that are coming out of a sun. And that radiation carries with it a pressure. And so what it does is it basically pushes against the outer layers of the star, keeping okay. it like, you know, if, if radiation pressure could continue forever, it would just expand the star forever. Wow. The thing that keeps it from doing that is gravity. So gravity okay. is on the outer layers of the star, pushing it back in. And so there's this like, duality between radiation and gravity. And so the stars kind of contract and expand over time, more or less, as they kind of go through their life. And so at okay. the end of a star's lifetime, it can't get that pressure to basically like be strong enough to um, counteract gravity. And so gravity takes over. Okay. So it starts to collapse the star and then the star <laughs> does this really cool thing that I learned about in grad school, actually. I didn't even know about this until I got to grad school. And I was like, what the fuck? This is so cool. So do you know what neutrinos are? What, what? Neutrinos are. It sounds like a, a pumpkin seed. So I'm going to bet it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is not like a seed. I kind of wish it were. Okay. So I'm to talk about this. Um, okay. So neutrinos are these tiny, tiny, we thought they were massless for a long time, particles. We thought they okay. were like photons. Photons don't okay. have mass. Turns I'm out, yeah. So any <sighs> photon that just like hits you is massless, which is crazy, crazy cool. Um, that's why they travel at, you know, the famous equation e equals mc squared. Mm -hmm. If you plug in m equals zero for a photon, that means E equals C. C mm -hmm. is the speed of light. So that means that photons travel at the speed of light because they are light mm -hmm. because they're massless. Oh my God, I feel I know. so much about college would have made so much more sense uh, if I had been on drug so cool. science on YouTube. I know. Uh, <laughs> All right, I'm going to put in my resignation tomorrow morning. I'm done with small efforts when I'm switching to stars. You're a new physicist, yes. Um, okay, so for these neutrinos, we thought that they were masses for a long time. Turns out they're not. Turns out they have a tiny, tiny mass. And the even cooler thing about neutrinos is that they... There are three distinct types, sorry, three, three distinct types. And when we were trying to detect neutrinos from the sun in these sub, like, what do you call sub earth? They, they were built into the earth. Under. Underground, yeah. Subnivian, I guess. Well, I mean, that's under snow. Sub yeah, well, yeah, I was gonna say, yeah. So anyway, they're like caverns of, um, basically vats of water and the, <laughs> the neutrinos would kind of zoom in and hit the water and make reactions. And we would try to understand how many neutrinos were coming from the sun. And every time we would measure it, we would get one third of the number that we thought it was. And we were like, what, why is this happening? Do we not understand physics? <sighs> Turns out that these neutrinos actually change flavor as they travel through space. So I said there were three flavors. The like tau neutrino will become a muon, muon neutrino as it travels through space. And so we'll get a muon neutrino when it initially left the sun as a tau neutrino. So these things just like morph 
and we get to try to count them. And when we poke that into account, we got all of the neutrinos that we expected from the sun. So basically evolution happens in space too. Kind of, yeah. I know, or I guess it's a yeah, shift, no, shift that's, change, or it's a state right. change. Yeah, there's some sort of change over time that happens. <laughs> so cool! I know, and it's it's a fundamental particle. It's a fundamental particle of the standard model. That's wild. It is. It I've is never wild. heard of that ever. I mean, I yeah. obviously, like I'm not taking classes, but I've never even heard that term. That's wild. So it's called. If any of you guys want to look it up, it's called the solar neutrino problem. It's not and a pumpkin it, seed. It's, it's it is not a, a pumpkin seed, but it is really cool. And they are tiny little particles that uh, basically just morph over time. And so going back to stars and going back to supernova, there are various reactions in a star that will um, basically form neutrinos by the byproduct. So two things will collide, and out comes a neutrino and another particle or a neutrino and light. And so wow. these neutrinos that are being formed in the core of the star, of this really massive star that is nearing the end of its life, actually form the pressure that pushes back out on the collapsing star and the neutrinos power the expansion and the explosion of the star. So it's not just as, like my question before you got to neutrinos was that basically if it's like a, a push and pull of like gravity and radiation, does the sudden absence of being able to process iron create a vacuum and that's why it collapsed. Exactly. So that's, that's right. So there's this vacuum of energy or like lack of energy. Right. And the star starts to collapse. And then these neutrinos that have been forming are like, fuck you. And they start zooming out and they push the material back out. And, and that's what causes the explosion. Yeah. Wow. That is so cool. I know. Okay. So <laughs> how does the black hole factor into that? So you said like a star after it explodes, it becomes one thing or a black hole. I yeah. missed, I forgot the term. So like what, uh, how do you get, what causes the difference? So depending on the initial mass of the star. So if you have less than about, if you have greater than an eight solar mass star, okay. but less than a 25 solar mass star. And th those like mass ranges are very, very nebulous, like not to bring in a space thing, but like they're very not well constructed. Um, less than 25 solar masses, but greater than eight solar masses gives you a neutron star. Wow, so okay. what happens is the core that um, is expelling these neutrinos shrinks within itself and forms a neutron star okay so a neutron star is this super super dense star it's like i forget exactly what the analogy is but it's like a tablespoon is like as dense as like a city or something it's wow crazy and that's not that's i know that's not right but it's something like that where it's uh, you cannot even fathom how dense this thing is and it's packed into such a small space. So that's a neutron star. Okay. If it's bigger than that, if the initial mass is bigger than 25 solar masses, oh yeah, okay, Andrew just corrected me. A tablespoon weighs the same as Mount Everest. So yeah, <laughs> it's fucked up. Holy <laughs> shit. It's crazy. That is wild. Um, and so are they much larger than that? Like when you say- so they're, so they're like, I think they're like a city. This is where the city thing is. I think they're like a city wide. Like they are way smaller than what we think these progenitor stars are. Right. Um, and so it expels most of its stuff and shrinks into this small compact thing. The initial mass that is greater than 25 solar masses or whatever actually becomes a black hole. So it collapses so much. There is so much mass that falls in on itself that it forms a black hole. And is a black hole really like what you see in Star Trek? Star Wars? Please don't hate me. I haven't watched all the Star really, Wars films. Like, I, it like, no. I like, like, fell asleep like, watching Star Wars last night. You guys, <laughs> it's I, like I'm a little the nighttime story. All the Star Wars films. They're just, they're like, oh, we're not going to talk to Imogene. She doesn't 
watch the good stuff. You haven't watched any of them? No, I've watched, um, it was episode four, which is the first one. Yeah, but I've watched like, four, on, man. one and something else. I know, I know, I know. Unfortunately, I managed to get married before I'd revealed most of this information. <laughs> um otherwise I was told you know I was on like I was treading on thin ice um but that's that- kind of my my boyfriend and I started dating and after we started dating he revealed that he'd never read Harry Potter and I was like you were very lucky that we are already dating <laughs> I had not ever read Harry <laughs> Potter when I that Harry Potter you haven't read Harry Potter so I had it when my when my now husband and I started dating and we worked this job in Montana where we were like literally living in a camper trailer in like minus 30 Fahrenheit up in like up by Glacier National Park and we didn't have like he and he just brought the books and was like here there's nothing to do yes you have no excuse (laughs) no excuse you have to you have to I mean it's literally when my kids if I ever have kids are born that is going to be the first thing that they listen to. And I will continue forever saying that every Sunday rather than Sunday school, they're going to be subject to me reading them. Harry Potter. I was told that I wasn't, I remember like very briefly in high school, my, I had a stepmother for many years and she like wouldn't let us like told us we couldn't read Harry Potter because it was, you know, some like uh, the devil or something, I don't, you know, witches and warlocks or something. You know what I mean? Like if you I never actually talked to someone who thought that. I, I, yeah, we didn't, we didn't think that and we weren't, I mean, like I grew up and went to church for like a period in my life. Um, but we weren't, I didn't grow up in like a, 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 a very, uh, strictly religious home. So it was kind of like an out of left field. Like, I'm sorry, what? Like, which is a warlock or the devil? What? Like, what, what, you know what I mean? So yeah. wow. I don't know, but yeah, I didn't read it until I, I think I, I think it was like 23 when I first read Harry Potter and, and well, I got it. To reread it and like watch the movies, like, you know, once with the other so okay so you reread them occasionally oh yes yeah yeah yeah. but I haven't gotten through all the Star Wars I'm just you know it's cool and I think I'd get into it but it's like, cool movie. Uh-huh. Like, obviously fucking awesome I don't know I just haven't like committed to it it's just like one of those things that I haven't done but I'm sure I'll be happy when I do it but people honestly I to talk to you I get the Star Wars more than I get Harry Potter. Like Harry right. Potter is universal. Like there is it really is. It's true. More important than Harry Potter. I think, <laughs> I think part of it is like I started to read. I read The Hobbit when I was fifteen. That's a good one. And wait, what is uh, the prequel with? No, The Hobbit is the prequel to Lord of the Rings. Like I yeah, yeah. started to read The Hobbit. I got like three, two thirds of the way through and I was like, I just can't get through the rest of it. And I was a little lukewarm about the movies, but I watched them all in one day. All of Lord of the Rings, you were lukewarm? Well, no, it was great, but I watched I thought it. you were supposed to be my new best friend. No, I mean, I liked it, but I watched it all in one day. This is like 10 years yeah, ago. That's a lot. Watched that all a lot. Three. It's like 13 hours of Lord of the Rings. Like, I feel like I don't remember very many. No, it's, it's a lot. You have to like take it. The first time I watched Lord of the Rings, for it was The Fellowship, and I was so scared that I had to stop it. And I was like, <laughs> I can't watch this. I was terrified and then like years later in high school I picked it back up and I was like oh my god what I've been missing out on my entire life this is amazing. now I'm gonna have to start watching these because I feel like you when are. I go and check like my follower account on Twitter there's gonna be a lot of like unfollow unfollow I'm unfollow. like <laughs> <laughs> she's not cool guys <laughs> she's really not like damn it now they know <laughs> I think we need to do and this is what I wanted for the Tiger King I want we need to do like a live streaming of one of these movies and just Ooh. like have everybody watch and hang out and we need like a live commentary on what's going on because I think that would be good. I I mean to be clear to be clear I think if we were to do a live commentary of me watching Harry Potter it would just be me like crying every second <laughs> and being like you guys it's so beautiful. Um, what's your but favorite um book slash film and those could be different answers but what's your favorite? Okay so I'm gonna couch this with aside from Harry Potter, because Harry Potter will forever be my favorite everything. (laughs) And I can't, like, I really can't get away from it. Okay, so favorite book, and this is any genre. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
Okay, so for science fiction, I think my favorite book is Ender's Game, which yeah, I'm kind of sad about because Orson Scott Card fucking sucks. Um, so that sucks. My favorite fantasy book is Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. My favorite sort of fiction book is Oh, fuck. I'm already drunk. What is the name? Um, what is the, what is the book of the guy crying? What is that called? A Little Life. Yeah. A Little Life. I read that? No. It, um, is devastating and beautiful. And I highly do not recommend anyone reading that during quarantine because there's like not enough emotional space for anyone <laughs> to read it, but it's incredible. Um, and then I think my favorite, oh God, my favorite movie. Fuck, I don't know. Is that easy for you to answer? No, because I feel like I don't watch a lot of films a whole lot. Um, like my reading really died off when I started grad school and I've been trying hard to pick it back up. Um, like I know people that are like voracious readers regardless of anything, but I feel like I've, I used to be a voracious reader and I'm just not anymore. Yeah, it's hard um, during grad school. I don't love going to like the movie theater and seeing movies. Like if I watch a movie, like I want to watch it at home. It's just same. I don't know. Like I just don't like. I just don't like movie theaters that much. Um, what movie do I love to watch? I mean, Harry Potter is always. I mean, any any of the Harry Potter series is always like a really easy, comforting go to for me. I've watched three Harry Potter movies movies this week. See, yeah, this exactly. Week. So it works. Um, I also really love, and it's mostly because I associate it with my mom because um, she introduced me to it. I love and will always watch Bridget Jones' Diary. Really? <laughs> I've never <laughs> watched it. it. I love it. It's such a good film. Is it I fun mean, or is it sad? No, it's hilarious. I highly really? recommend it. I mean, there's like some, you know, real stuff in it, I suppose, but it's super lighthearted and easily digestible. And, and, and I mean, Renee Zellweger is hilarious and it's got Hugh Grant and Colin Firth who, uh, it's Colin Firth, like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so question, in terms of space movies, have you seen Interstellar? Someone just mentioned it in the chat, and so I'm curious. Fuck, okay, have you seen Gravity? I haven't, so I haven't watched a movie in like <laughs> a long time. I didn't, okay. grow up, I didn't grow up watching movies. Uh, like, we just really weren't allowed to watch a lot of movies, and I feel like that's something that's been, like, uh, that's not something that I've pursued much as an adult. Yeah, I it's guess. hard. Um, I mean, when I'm pop culture, I suck at. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's hard. I also am so bad at pop culture. I get very anxious whenever someone's like, do you want to go to trivia? And I'm like, no, <laughs> like, I don't know anything about it. I'll go and yell things, but none of them will be right. <laughs> that's the thing is, like, I especially for trivia for someone asked me if I wanted to go to Harry Potter trivia and I was like if I don't get everything right and win my entire identity will be questioned and then I'll, like spiral like it would not be okay wait did we already talk about this last week what house are you what house are you I don't know but I'm happy to talk about it again I am I mean, a Gryffindor okay we did talk about it I thought you said Gryffindor I am a Ravenclaw okay yes okay yes um, are you happy with your house? I am. At first I was like, oh my god, I don't want to be in Gryffindor, but like you read I'm like, okay, cool. Like Ravenclaw, it works. It works. Yeah. I think honestly, most of my friends are in Ravenclaw. It's a good house to be in. Yeah. I my ex was in Slytherin and I almost broke up with him when he saw something in Slytherin and I really should have. That's my it. my my husband is in Gryffindor and so he's very much like suck at your back, like we're the best um, yep. of the yep. best. Um yep. I just like I feel like I identify very strongly with Luna Lovegood. And so it works. Luna is the best. Luna is the best. The character, the actress is just fantastic. I just want to put her in my pocket and keep her. But like, just the act, you know, the character is phenomenal and just delightful. Um, you very know Phoebe the story the, the behind the actress. What was that? Do you know the story behind the actress? It's a really cool story. It's, it's awesome. a it's an interesting story. I mean, like, I I don't follow pop culture so much, and I know all the specifics behind. Um, some of the problematic stuff that J.K. Rowling has kind of, yeah. you know, been caught up in, and obviously yeah. things that I have are like, ah, oh, that's, that's a little bit sideways. Like that's kind of yeah. that, that sucks. Uh, yeah. Just to put it nicely. Uh, but the cool thing about the, the Luna Lovegood story, the actress whose name I forget, she uh, wrote J.K. Rowling because she loved Harry Potter and she had a really serious eating disorder. 
I don't remember if it was anorexia or bulimia, um, but she wrote to J.K. Rowling and said, you know, she loved the books and the books helped her. And J.K. Rowling wrote her back and said, basically, essentially, call me when you are healthy again and we will find you a, sp- a space in the movie. And yeah. that's how she got the part for Luna Lovegood. Yeah. Which is no, just so I, awesome. Yeah. I completely agree with everything you just said. I, I've seen JK Rowling because she was off Twitter for a while and she's been back on Twitter recently during the quarantine. And I'm like, oh, like I don't really endorse kind of what's been happening over the last couple of years as you've kind of spoken more vocally about things. Right. However, I will never, ever divorce myself of Harry Potter. And the Luna Lovegood story is a perfect one. It's really so, sweet. I think it's really, really cool. I don't know if she still okay. acts, but they do really, really cool Does stuff. she still act? I don't think I've ever seen her. In, I mean, I don't know if that was her real hair or anything, but I don't I think that one of my friend's wives, because I, I saw this on Instagram, one of my friend's wives went to an event in New York City. It was like a makeup event. And I'm pretty sure that actress was there, like just at the event, which has nothing to do with answering, your question, answering the question, does she still act or not? But she was in New York City a couple of months ago. <laughs> Oh, that sounds really creepy now that I said like how, how do I hear how do you know that? How do I know that? <laughs> sure I don't remember her name. <laughs> Who is the most famous person you've ever met? That I've ever met? I remember in high school, this is not a good story at all. Um <laughs> <laughs> So I met some fame. So, okay, so when I was 16, I was at an event for school and there was a, I went through a phase, a very short phase. I'm happy to say, and if you'd like this, I'm really sorry, but I'm just not, a, I used to be a big fan of country music because I like where I talked about last week. I grew up on a farm. Right. North Carolina, Harry Potter's the devil. You can kind of guess yeah. the type of environment that I grew up in. And um, I went through a country music phase naturally as a farm kid does. And we were at this event and the country music singer, his name was Billy Currington, I think. Okay. I don't, that doesn't mean anything to me now, but it did at the time. And I was like, oh my God, Billy Currington. And he was like doing like a meet and greet. And you know, all these like, you know, adolescent girls are like standing in line to meet this famous person. And then I guess he got like a call and it was like time to leave. And he just like stood up and walked away and left. And so all these girls are standing, all these girls are like standing there and looking sad and forlorn. And I'm just like, just like cut the line and chase them. Like, like, hello, like beetle mania, just chase them. Like, have you not learned anything from history? So I like, you know, I'm like, hey, Billy, hey, Billy. No, I did this. And he just like turned around and as opposed to like, you know, like calling the cops and was like, tiny child he was super nice he walked up to me and he said hello and it was like a 10 second thing and then he reached out and he kissed me on the cheek stop which are which was it was not you know one of those weird things where he's like i'm gonna lean forward and kiss you yeah, yeah, like yeah. inappropriate at all yeah, he yeah. like kissed me on the cheek and then like bye darling or something <laughs> and i just stood there like Dad. <laughs> so that's basically the story and i don't even know i couldn't name any of the songs now i don't know anything at all <laughs> uh-huh. I met anybody famous other than that. I, yeah. I, I think about this. We'll come back to it. What about yeah. you? Um, I was trying to think of my answers and the only two things I can think of, this is so fucking lame. So one, I played tennis for my entire life until I got to college. I played in college for my first year and then I quit because I hated it and I was injured and I was like, this is terrible. And when I was a kid and like, I was like nine or something, I was a ball girl for a match that was really famous um and so if you know tennis you'll know these names like Andy Roddick for example yeah, yeah yeah so he was there um James Blake was there and wow. the like really sad part of the story is I like <laughs> I mean I was like nine and I ran across the court to pick up a ball and I dropped it and the the commentator goes, oh, fumble, like in the microphone and the entire stadium of people started laughing. <laughs> I was like, mm. you don't know that it's like not really about you, but it has to be more oh, exactly. And no, I was like, what? Like, I just like could not put the pieces together. So that was the one thing. And the other thing 
and this is this is arguably more embarrassing purely because I have no self-awareness um <laughs> when I was in college I realized like I don't know halfway through my second semester or something that there were Nobel Prize laureates that were in our department and I went down to the like coffee shop in our building and they started walking around and all of a sudden like three Nobel Prize laureates came out and they were all talking to each other about physics and I, I literally stood there like spilling my coffee because I was like so enamored by them I was like so starstruck I was like oh my god can you imagine the brains and then and that was <laughs> and that's that's my yeah it was so embarrassing but anyway. I, got to, I got to meet a um this is so when you said like famous person obviously I think of like most of us know celebrities but similarly so when I <laughs> not scientists what I said not scientists. Yeah, like, most people think of scientists, but I have met one famous scientist. Um, so after I got my master's, I worked at a, a, a lab from the university or a lab that was run by the University of Georgia. It was called the Savannah River Ecology Lab. I was just like a lab technician. We were doing like microsatellite research and I was basically studying um, population genetics of uh, the Florida striped newt. So I'm just like all day, like, you know, like pipetting at this bench by myself. And my boss walks in one day and I'm like, kind of like all leaned over being all serious and just trying to get all this work done. Um, and she walks up to me and she's like, hi, I'm just want to introduce you to somebody because you'd said that you previously had read some of his books. Um, you know, this is Whit Gibbons, who is, you know, if, if you're an ecologist, he's written books like, he's written a bajillion books. One of the most famous ones is called Their Blood Runs Cold. Um, Jay Whitfield Gibbons, he like started Savannah River. He's like a famous herpetologist. Um, what is a herpetologist? I, huh? A herpetologist is someone who studies reptiles and amphibians. Okay. So there's a lot of really cool herpetologists on Twitter, by the way. Um, oh, but so great. he's a famous herpetologist. And basically, you know, I've read a bunch of his books. We studied some of his like uh, ideas during my master's. And, you know, I'm sitting on this like bench, this like bar, bar height uh, lab stool pipetting. And she walks up and she's like, hi, this is Whit Gibbons. And I just kind of like fell out of the chair. <laughs> I kind of like, I went to like move one butt cheek off of the bench so I could, you know, like really, really slowly like, hi, my name is Imogen, like here's my hand. And I'm just kind of like, the pipette flies, one butt cheek goes, the other one goes, and I just kind of like stumble about and he's just like, hi. Oh my God. It was really painful. And I, again, so it was good. just, it's not the way you think it would go. And so realistically, I don't know if I want to meet any more of my heroes because <laughs> I don't think that I can handle it. I, I know, like I I can't, I really don't think I can. I, the problem is when I get really, ex when I feel any emotion to like a very large degree, I start crying and it's it's not, it's not good. <laughs> so right. if I meet any of one of my heroes, I'm just going to be like, oh my God. And then I'll start crying. It's just like, how can you talk to that person? You know, like you can't, it's not. Yeah. I just wouldn't be able to shut up realistically. <laughs> it would be bad. It would just, here, let me just vomit more words out of my mouth. <laughs> um, okay. So let's talk about your weirdest moment doing science getting more wine. Weirdest moment doing science. Yes. Um, and I think it's a good segue to some of the other stuff we wanted to talk about, but I want to make sure you answer yours first. Um, so I did this really cool bear project a couple of years, well, several years ago. Oh my gosh, I'm dating myself. Back in 2011. You did that last time too. When, when, I, when I was very young, um, <laughs> when I was still in my twenties, um, I did this cool job working on, we were in Missouri studying population structure of bears. And basically the job boils down to two things. We were setting camera traps in the woods um, and we were radio collaring bears and picking up their collars when they drop them. So, you know, you put a radio collar on an animal, um, they walk around the woods, you get data points about their movement and their locations. But sometimes if you either don't set, if you don't like put the collar on tight enough or they lose a lot of weight or they're just really creative, they can just like pop it off. So a huge part of my job was going out in the woods and based on the la like the satellite and GPS data, triangulating like the last known location of where that collar was when it started to give like a mortality, a mortality signal. But in this case, it was a, a not moving because the bear was dead. It's just, it wasn't, it was on the ground. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. So do you get these bears by trapping them or like how yes. do you, okay. And then yes. 
how do you triangulate their signals? Just GPS or? Yeah, like so the bears have, um, there's two different types. There's GPS, there's different types of GPS technology. So there's technology where um, all the data is like stored on a, a, a so the animals were in a collar and there's like a small battery, like appropriate sure. to their body size and weight that stores all their location data, but it still is, it's able to, um, register its location based on satellite. So it gives off a signal. Um, so the different type of technology is that like you can remotely download it, but that's not relevant to your question. Um, realistically, when you get, sorry, I'm getting really excited. Great. Um, so when an animal is wearing a collar, regardless of the type, it's gonna emit a signal based on its location. And so the satellites, you know, you've got a bunch, you got a bajillion satellites floating around the earth. It might, ping, it's gonna ping several different ones. And so when you have a GPS uh, or a GPS unit, I didn't know uh, that. I didn't. Yeah, know. no, it's really great technology because oh. it requires. Like, um, sorry, when you have like a, a the telemetry unit, so you've got like your battery that basically tunes into the unique signal. Every uh, call, let me back up. I'm sorry, I'm getting way too scattered here. And every individual collar that you put on a bear or any animal has its own um, signal, so it's its own like radio stations, its unique identifier. So okay. when you have like a, a giant. Um, like a, a radio transmitter, you've got different stations that you can tune into and you basically tune in to like the station that you've assigned for that individual sure. collar. And if it's within a readable distance, the signal is gonna bounce off of different uh, satellites that are floating or orbiting around the earth. Okay. And so we triangulate an individual animal by taking several different readings, but these readings are dependent on how many satellites they connect to. So in order to get a reliable location or a reliable signal, you're hoping that it's gonna like kind of like a GPS unit, it's gonna collect, it's gonna connect to a couple of different satellites. And so realistically, when I'm out in the woods, I've got like um, a GPS transmitter in my hand and it's got a cord to it. And I basically got like some um, clothes line hanger looking thing. It's called a Yagi. And it basically oh, what? <laughs> it's called a Yagi. Like uh, I don't I think it's spelled it's sounds like Y-A-G-I. So you're holding the Yagi and it's like your, you know, tin hat type looking thing. It's like <laughs> a bunch of crossed uh, metal. And my husband's yelling antenna. So that is the word, it's the antenna. <laughs> I love Matt. Matt so anyways, um, so you've got your antenna and you're trying to get your signal, but basically when it, when an individual's collar bounces off a satellite, it's going to emit a signal. And basically by turning your antenna or your Yagi, you can determine the, like the actual, uh, uh, the angle that the signal is coming from. Okay. And so in order to like pinpoint or triangulate an animal's location, you have to do that three different times. So in theory, if an animal is like, this is an animal, you want to be able to go around where it's, putative location is try to get three different uh triangulations because you're basically making a triangle right two data points you have no idea like where is that animal actually you need at least one third data point to create it like where is the center of a triangle right actually okay um, so three is the minimum that you would need three is the minimum and so you have yeah. to do it in a short period of time like because an animal might be moving so it's like if you can't do this in 15 minutes then basically your triangulation or your data points don't count um and so like the project that I was on, we weren't, ha we didn't have to do individual triangulations like that. Um, the person who's running the project, they got the data, uh, basically they downloaded it to their computer. So they had like more accurate locations based on the type of uh, uh, technology that collars had, but we still found out that collars were dropped off like bears slipped a collar. And so on this particular day, the story of the weird thing that happened to me. I was looking for this bear collar and, you know, we're working by ourselves. Um, you know, I was a team of six. It was um, five guys and me living in a house. So I was like Snow White. Uh, side note, living in a house full of men when you're all like in your early 20s and your field biologist is disgusting. <laughs> I can um, imagine. I mean that with as much respect as possible. Y'all are disgusting. Um, but, <laughs> so and that's including my spouse because he was on that project. Um, but <laughs> is that how you guys met? Um, so we, that's a different story. Uh, I we feel like I was, asked you this last time. No, you didn't. Um, my okay. spouse is a wildlife biologist also, but we met when I was 17. No way. I haven't been dating that long. I am, how old am I? I'm 33. So we haven't been dating that long, but we met then and that's a whole different story, but he's all, okay, he, he's okay we'll get back to it. Biologist. And we worked on this job together in which I learned boys are disgusting. Men are disgusting. Mm -hmm. All of them are gross. Anyways, women are gross too. People are gross. Just by everyone, the Everyone, everyone living. So, which is relevant to my story. Humans are nasty because that's the punchline. Um, so on this particular day, a bear dropped his collar. I'm out in the woods. I'm two miles from my truck. 
the bear dropped the collar and my signal was bouncing a lot. And I basically, when it is bouncing that much, you know, you're probably close or it's like buried under something. So Wait, basically, they ever it. like rip their collar off? Or I think sometimes they can, but these ones are really, really strong. They're like made out of, um, uh, what is it, like fire, uh, fire hose material, or there's like a layer uh, oh, of that around wow. it. So, you know, these ones, if, since it's an adult bear, they didn't make a, an area to grow. So it's not okay. supposed to have give. Um, so in theory, they're not supposed to do it, but if you put it on too loose, or if you like collar the animal in winter before, when they're high, like before they hibernate, oh, when they're really, really fat, that's smart. And then, like, they can slip it in, in the spring. Um, and so in this case, that was that just the, the collar was too loose for the bear. And he basically just like took his feet and just like kicked it off of his, off oh. his neck, but I couldn't find the collar. And so basically when you get like that, you just get down on your hands and knees and start like, you're just digging around in the earth, just looking for it. Cause I know that I'm in like a, uh, uh, basically I'm in like my, my signal is strong enough that I can guess I'm in like a 12 foot radius. So I'm so just you, like, you have your antenna and you're just like, mm, like, where is it? Like that. So I'm triangulating where it is. And I know that I'm relatively close, but in this case, I had more information because I knew based on the satellite data that, uh, um, our supervisor had downloaded, I knew the last known approximate latitude and longitude based on like satellite data. So I was my, I was hiking out to there and then using my antenna to try to like get the loudest signal before I started looking. Cause there is some like error in your GPS telemetry. Um, and basically I'm looking for it and um, I'm on my hands and my knees looking for the darn thing. It's been like 30 minutes and usually I've never had this problem. And then I realized why the bear must have slipped his collar is because when I'm crawling on my hands and knees, looking through leaf litter, I didn't even think about this and I'm such an idiot. I uncovered with my hands while my face was over top of it, a hornet's nest. Oh no. Like, you know, I look, I'm just like looking and I'm like at a sapling and all of a sudden just like, no, <laughs> they just like <laughs> erupt. Oh, and, you know, but thankfully when they erupted, they were really mad at my hands and they didn't just like, you know, attack my face. And so you've never, I would have loved to be like a squirrel or a songbird because like or, I like, just, order of magnitude. How many do you think there were? I don't know because I ran screaming like bloody murder down this creek bed. I was literally running, waving my arms. Like there's no water. It was a dry creek bed. Like there's nothing for me to like jump into. It's just a matter of how fast can I get away from the <laughs> devils. Um, and I'm fortunately not allergic to, I might've been a wasp, but I really still don't know what species to this day it was. I don't, I only got stung 11 times. I don't know how it happened, but like I, my, my, my arm was like a giant sausage. <laughs> and so like, I remember this is like, I feel like I'm, I'm talking too long. So if you're actually hoping for me to get to the point, I still haven't gotten there yet. Um, the weird stuff hasn't even started happening yet. So I'm like, you know, the, 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 I'm, I'm running down the creek bed. I am, I've gotten stunned. I've run like a quarter of a mile. Unfortunately that, you know, I was in a creek bed. So I, you know, I left all my stuff, which is not great survival uh, technique. But unfortunately, I could follow my way back after about a half an hour. So I'm like lying on the side of the creek bed, just panting, you know, wondering if this is when I'm going to learn that I'm allergic to wasps or bees because I'm two miles from my truck. And I didn't have an EpiPen. And I don't even think I had Ben. I probably didn't even have Benadryl with me. Yeah. Unfortunately, Did I'm not you allergic. Did you have your stuff or were you just like. Oh. I had dropped it and just like ran. God. But fortunately, like I was a lot of creek bed so I could easily walk back. It wasn't a matter of like being completely screwed over right. and lost in right. the woods. Um, and so I'm lying there and I hear this cheeping and I look up and there's this little cluster of um, uh, juvenile chickadees. So certain songbirds, when they um, fledge the nest, they will, a bunch of birds will like hang out in like communal groups. Oh. And uh, chickadees are one of those. There's a lot of them that are like that, but chickadees are one of them. And I like open my eyes and like I'm lying at the edge of this creek bed, kind of like under some brambles, like just feeling really sorry for myself. And these like little songbirds are like, <laughs> what's wrong with you? Like you small, oh, strange creature. Awesome. And they got like this far from me because I'm lying under the bushes oh, kind oh of. Oh my God. It was obvious they'd never seen a human before. And they were just kind of like, like, what are you doing? You know, she's like, I'm trying to live. <laughs> and, you know, and then after that, I, I, I got my stuff. I'd never found the bear collar. I was like, you know what? I'm done. Like, I don't know where the bear collar is. If it's anywhere near that nest, there's no way in hell I'm actually going to go try uh -huh. to dig that up. Um, and so I hike, I'm hiking back to the truck. I'm already late because I had an event to go to. And I'm like, I need to get back. And I'm like, hoofing it as fast as I can. Like my arm is throbbing. My arm is like the size of my sweater at this point. Um, and I'm getting back to my truck and my well, truck, you know, it, 
what was that it swells that much not really i was being a little bit dramatic uh, it was probably i mean but okay it wasn't actually this big sorry i was being dramatic i feel like I, i'm sorry i forget i need to be technical here the actually scientist in me. no exactly i was gonna say I'm, I'm i'm being a good storyteller and a bad scientist so no, my arm was like it really is. swollen and so like you know i'm on forest service land um and so you know it's publicly owned land um there's not houses on it but in where we were in missouri we had huge pockets of public land uh basically surrounded by private land and vice versa which sure. is the way the puzzle piece of the landscape went and so i parked my truck at the beginning of the day before all this happened in the middle of like a field it's i knew i was on federal land so i wasn't like gonna you know get in trouble or anything i had like a state um conservation department vehicle so i had a big logo on the side of my truck and i like emerged out of the woods i'm like Oh, you know, so happy to see the truck. I'm just like walking there. I'm angry. I'm feeling sorry for myself. I didn't get the car, so I'm feeling defeated. And as soon as I like kind of go up into the hill on this field, I realize that there is somebody in the field. And this is really remote work. And so like we're always taught that the most dangerous thing about being outside is not really the wildlife, it's the people. Oh, dear. And so because I was working on a bear project, we always carried bear spray. And for those of you who don't know what bear spray is, bear spray is um, <laughs> it's basically military grade pepper spray, but it's in a canister that's like this big. It shoots like 15 feet. It's um, intense. It's supposed to incapacitate grizzly bears. Like it's, it, they don't play. And so I always kept, you know, I was working on a bear project. We were like tracking bears. So I I had it always on my hip at all times, but most projects where I'm legally able to have bear spray, so like you can't carry it in Central Asia, so I didn't have it last summer. Wait, um, really? I, yeah, it's not like uh, like in China, like you know, uh, firearms aren't legal for for citizens. Like bear spray is not legal in Kyrgyzstan. Um, I don't remember the specific. I want to ask you more about international stuff later. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, which a lot of these problems are also the same. But you know, I have my canister of bear spray, which I feel like is a great leveling because you don't have to get like you don't have to wait for someone to get close to you or an animal to get close to you. Right. Um, but you know, I immediately think of all these things because standing next to the driver's seat, driver's side of my vehicle is just some guy just standing there and he's like, he's waiting for me. I mean, he's just standing there. I don't know if he was waiting. He has no idea like when I was gonna merge or I don't know how long he'd been there. And like, I'm immediately on edge because this is remote. Like I don't have cell service. I have no idea who he is. Like who, who, the, who is just on, on federal property other than some weird woman getting chased by wasps in the creek bed. That's fun. Um, And he like turns around and sees me and, um, we like he kind of like comes towards me and i'm still going towards my vehicle because i need to basically i need to get in my vehicle and i obviously need to i need to keep distance between the two of us but also like i need to like get him away from my vehicle so i can get into the vehicle but i don't know what i don't know is he friendly is he just is he lost is he were you, not, were you freaking out i was really nervous i mean i would be a little more comfortable now because maybe I've, I've had more experience but yeah. still like i'd already worked in uh northwest montana where like there you know there's a lot of meth labs and so we yeah. were trained to be really careful about like i don't know like what this person is about or why is there and the reason i you know women in science is a huge issue because you know being alone in the woods is dangerous for anybody because any bad thing can happen you can get vaccine you can get attacked by an animal you can get attacked by a person stray bullets blah 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 being a woman exacerbates that because you have to worry about um, you know, really significantly you have to worry about sexual assault. And, and in this case, I'm, I'm happy to report that I'm fine, but I didn't know that in the moment because when he approached me, he turned out to talk to me, his penis was hanging out. What? Yeah. This just, just hanging out, man. Holy fuck. Pants and were on. Um, he was just, ex he, he had fuck. exposed himself and he just stood there and didn't break eye contact with me at all. I mean, he kind of acted like he was a little bit drunk. But I just was, um, didn't acknowledge it, just tried to ask him, like, what are you, what are you doing? And, um, you know, oh, I'm doing this, like, you know, I need God. to leave. And just, like, kind of, you know, you can lead people with your body language. I kind of basically led him away from the door, and I was able to just, like, dive into the vehicle. And, and that's basically how the story ends, folks. That's just some guy in the woods with his dick hanging out. Holy shit. <laughs> Sorry, my husband just, like, burst out laughing in the background. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god everyone in the chat is being like did you bear spray <laughs> no i didn't bear spray but i definitely thought i was gonna have to though i mean like i literally like i have my backpack on and 
Did you have the bear spray in your hand or was it? Just no, like I have my hand on the holster. So like you yeah. basically wear it, like, I guess you would wear like a weapon. And so it has its holster and you can um, pull it out, but then it still has its own safety clip. So you can't actually accidentally bear spray yourself, which I have definitely almost done. Um, yeah. But I definitely had my hand on it kind of like casually kind of like pop the hip. Pop. Kind of like you bud? kind of thing. So yeah. I don't, I, I don't know if I should have done anything different in that moment. Um, um, I don't think there's anything you could do because, you know, there's no way to read a situation until you're on the other, on the other side of it. You, I mean, he was, you know, I'm five, three, uh, you know yeah. what I mean? Like I'm not a tall person. I'm not a big person. I'm not like a, a super athlete. Yeah. You know what I mean? Wait, how tall are you? I'm, I'm five, three and three quarters. Oh, okay. So <laughs> see, exactly. We, we short people uh, yeah. are, not, are, are at a competitive disadvantage <laughs> yep. in so many ways. <laughs> um, so I, I guess I want to make this a little bit more serious because I think this topic is a little bit more serious. Um, how were you after that episode? I mean, how was it getting back in the field? How was it being a scientist and trying to do your work? Did it affect you? Do you think you kind of pushed it to the side or, um, yeah, how did it affect you? It was one of those things where um, I didn't feel like I really had time to process it because I, as soon as I got back, um, I got back to the vehicle, I had like a 30 minute drive back to our field house and um, we had like our field crew was waiting to go somewhere. It was like a, a team dinner or whatever, like the whole crew had gotten together. Um, I think it was like the end of the week and I was like an hour late as a result of, you know, just the whole thing because the guy took a while to get first. It. the whole it was just a sideways day yeah um and I remember like I I pull my vehicle up and I get out and like my supervisor's like why are you late and I'm like well first I went to try to find you know the collar and I um found a wasp nest and like you know my hands all like my arms all swollen uh, it was okay I just you know it wasn't like a major yeah. injury but you know it wasn't a good day um and I started to like tell what had happened and I basically just kind of got cut off because we had to go um and I didn't really get to talk about it with anybody I mean I did like I told the you know the people that I was working with later and we were friends but it was different because it was it was like I mean it's a funny story to tell now like I'm a good story you know I feel like I can tell a story in a funny way um but like I don't think that they really I don't want to say they didn't care. Like if, I, if something had happened to me, obviously they would have cared, but I just don't think that the realization was necessarily for any of us, myself included. You know what I mean? It's, yeah, like, I do. it's like, oh my gosh, if like something, if, if something that happened like that to like someone that I know now, or like, you know, someone who was, like I was 23, you know what I mean? Or 24, like, you know, very young. Like I would have been wanting to ask, are you okay? How do you feel? Like, what does, you know, Monday look like for you? Like, how do you feel after coming back yeah. from work the next day? And I didn't think to think about that myself. And I don't think that, you know, like my colleagues did. Um, and it's not because I didn't care. I think it's just like a, a situational awareness thing. You know, I was working, I was the only woman on the team. Um, yeah. Yeah, it definitely spooked me a little bit. I think that even now, like I'm very hesitant about being in, you know, that's not the only bad, like scary thing that's happened. And I'm certainly not the only biologist that have had like weird experiences. And, and when you add other layers to it, like, you know, being a person of color, there are so many scenarios in which being in the woods is incredibly dangerous. And unless you, because that or you people, talk about it. Or because, because of the people or because of the animals? Because, sorry, because of the people. Yeah. Wow. I mean, like, you know, like, you know, there's so many people on Twitter that, that talk about not being able to go into their field sites at night because they're not white. And, and I, you know, obviously I, I can't speak that I didn't have no knowledge about that. And that's just obviously so incredibly horrible and fucked up. And, you know, adding like the human layer to any kind of research is really difficult. And thinking about it in the context of a woman, it's, it's frustrating that no matter where I am in the world, I have to worry about the possibility that I could be sexually assaulted if someone wanted to. Yeah. And I have a lot of friends that are biologists that have had horrible things happen to them and I'm not going to tell their stories and I've had people who had near misses that were along those same veins and you know I when I was in in Kyrgyzstan um last summer you know for us since we're on this on the serious subject I 
you know, we have this, I had this great team. It was awesome. I could not have been more fortunate. I have this, you know, just phenomenal group of snow leopard biologists and field biologists. Like we're a great team. Everyone's looking out for one another. And on this, you know, it was like the first week we're out there and they, they were sending me out with this uh, volunteer. This, we had one volunteer, a young woman from Australia and they sent her and I together out in the field. And it was like the third day in a row. And I've done a lot of mentoring, but I was like, well, some of these guys have done even more field work than I have. Like we really kind of need to change it up like I don't want it to be just a, a, a male crew members and female crew members and I you know she needs more experience not just with me um, so she can get a more well-rounded education and also like you know I want to work with some of these you know teammates that I've brought on for this project and I also you know feel bad for this ranger because I don't speak Kyrgyz and he's stuck with this Australian woman and this American woman for the third day in a row and we can't we don't speak the same language so how bored must he be <laughs> and so I asked, you know, one of my crew members when we got home and I was like, um, you know, so, you know, uh, uh, you know, Shannon and Raheem are, are, have gone up on this mountainside by themselves. You know, I feel comfortable enough that maybe we could split up um, and send, you know, maybe the herder uh, could go himself or he could go with you. And, and uh, this guy was like, well, no, like he should be with you. And I'm like, well, um, I wasn't really me like asking. It was me saying what I would like to do. And he's like, yes, but it's not safe. And I just didn't get it. I was like, what do you yeah. mean it's not safe? Like I've been hiking for years. Like I've done mountain work. Like this is not a, this is not a big deal. And this, even the volunteer has a lot of experience. And he said, he just was so uncomfortable. And he finally said, he's like, it's not safe because we don't know all of the herders that are along this mountain range. Wow. And so, you know, I didn't even think about that. I mean, like you think about some of us, like really high elevation there at the roof of the world. And it's like, it, it's so frustrating that as a woman, like I can, I'm literally at the roof of the world and I have to worry about be, I have to worry about men. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, I'm not, you know, there's a lot of layers to unpack there, but you know. That's you know. quite the quote. Yeah. And like, that's just, that's just frustrating and nothing happened. No instances, like I described on, on, you know, uh, the guy in the woods with the, oh. with the um, but it's just it's frustrating. And we, that's not something that has ever been, I've only ever had one supervisor talk to me about that. And it was a woman, you know, it was my very first job. And we had those conversations, just the two of us in the woods all day all for three and a half months. We did had you ask her about it or did she like, in no. order to, yeah. She was like, we need, you know, these are the things that we do. Like, you know, we're in cougar country, we're in grist country, we carry bear spray, but you need to know that if you come here, like, you know, there's a lot of meth labs in this part of the uh, part of the world. And, you know, it's always a possibility we will run into somebody and there's always a possibility we will have to defend ourselves and it won't necessarily just be from wildlife. So and for those of you listening, that doesn't mean that you need to go and look over your shoulder and be scared because the reality is like, you know, if, if I'm in Grizz country and I, I piss off a mother Grizz in, in July, she, she's probably going to come for me. And she's probably going to like dis, disembowel me. Like it's going to suck, you know? And so like, that is just as like, that's, I guess, more likely than something really bad happening in the middle of the woods. And it's also, and it's not very likely for starters that, that, that that's going to happen with a bear. Like, it's just not that likely people don't get stalked and killed by mountain lions often. Um, you know, a very, it's a very rare thing. So like the likelihood of that happening is not very high, I suppose, but being able to have those conversations is important. And so like, you know, I don't know how you have, I don't know how you stream on those conversations for undergrads. I mean, it's hard enough. When, I, you know, I, you have, yeah. I, mean, I think it's realistic that's having conversations like this and being candid about it. It's like, Hey, like we need to be prepared for this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or it's something that you need to be cognizant of because if you're cognizant of it, that adds a degree of preparedness. That's not that's not there if you just hadn't thought of it, I guess, you know what I mean? Oh, like, that's right. That's right. So. I, um, the first discussion I had about anything regarding this, I was at, I was interning out of the observatory my first, right after my first year of college. And one of the female engineers um, that was working on one of the major research telescopes which was not at all to do with what I was working on, um, pulled me aside basically and said, let's talk. And she talked to me about her experience with other engineers and, you know, being the only woman um, right. out there in the middle of West Texas where, you know, you don't even have a major city nearby right. and what that was like. And, I remember honestly like being shocked 
and being like, this is horrible, but also having this sort of out of body experience where I was like, I don't know if this will ever happen to me. You know, I have guy friends and I, you know, talk to guys all the time. And I, you know, I'm a tomboy, you know, for most of my life. And I, I, I just had this sort of cognitive dissonance behind that. And the, honestly, my awareness has increased as I've gotten older and I've gotten more into the field. And there are times that I look back now um, and I feel bad for like young Serafina who was in these situations and didn't know what to do. Um, right. There is one situation that I haven't really spoken about publicly and I, I probably won't like write anything about it. I mean, maybe I will, but I was at a conference and, um, I went out for drinks with someone, um, with a bunch of other people. So it was me, a couple of undergraduates and another faculty member and, um, the faculty member's colleague who was also like a postdoc faculty member sort of position. The two, uh, people in sort of power positions were men and, um, the undergraduates were a mix of men and women. And it was sort of like four undergraduates to uh, sort of like older people or people that had more power. And we start drinking and we're having a good time. And all of a sudden the drinks start to hit and the postdoc, like the friend of the, the faculty member that we trusted and, and still trust, I think he's a great person. Um, the friend got really, really sort of abrasive and starts hitting on the waitress and starts telling sexual jokes and sexual stories about him being a, you know, member of his field and having undergraduates come up to him and kind of like sort of shimmy their way up. And, and he basically was saying like, I'm having a great time. Um, and I, at the time, it was sad because I, I really wish I'd realized like, this isn't okay. This is not something anyone should have to experience. Um, but I had no idea what to do. I mean, I kind of sat there and was like, all right, like, I'm just lucky to be out here with two people in my field and I'm just gonna suck it up. And it's only years later, really years later where I've been like, that was totally inappropriate. And I really wish I had never been exposed to that because that was not okay. No, it's not. And that's how these types of people are successful is they're depending on yes. the lack of confidence, lack of experience, the smooth, smooth it over. And you don't realize what's happened until it's already happened. Yes. Uh, and there's situation. a power dynamic as well. I think right. There's even in the story that you told about the guy that showed up at the, your door, there was a power dynamic that you couldn't get in the door. Right. Um, and you, you yeah, know. exactly. And he exposed himself. So it's two layers. It's like, you talk about the psychology of people who flash and it's like, they've you taken away, you've eliminated consent. Yes. In, in that, in that way. And it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's odd. And, and you know, I'm, I'm super fortunate that I don't have like a worse story to tell. Um, yeah, and I think you. the thing that sucks is that I feel like I have to w- be careful in how I say this because if someone had told me at the age of 21 or 22 that this thing could happen to me, I would want to, I don't, I won't think it wouldn't scare me out of my field because even at like 20 or 21 or 22, I'd say, well, okay, like maybe, I, maybe I shouldn't be a wild biologist because some guy wasn't going to show me his dick or I have to worry about, you know, getting like raped on the top of a mountain or something, you know, by strangers in the middle of nowhere. But, but the fear, the, the under, the, what that underscores is that it's a problem for women no matter what. And so when we hear about these stories and we talk about uh, power imbalances and, and, you know, social inequity in science, it's, it's true and real and pervasive. And there's so many layers and so many reasons why it's fucked up and unacceptable and why it's pervasive. But it's also pervasive across fields. So if I had said, well, I'm not going to go do this because of this, I'll go do this. It would be shit, different discipline. 
And that's the problem. Um, obviously, in certain disciplines or in certain social circles, there are offenders that are, are uh, bolder and have gotten away with it longer. And, and I'm not saying that that's not true. And I'm not saying that science is just as bad uh, or is making as much progress as, as other fields. Because that certainly isn't the case. But it's pervasive everywhere. And that's why I think it's so important for people listening to it doesn't have to be some weird back, some weird quiet whisper network conversation. No, and I, it yes, shouldn't be. No, it shouldn't be. Enough, but that is how women have protected themselves right. and each other. Right. Because I have been at conferences and had female former supervisors and colleagues come up to me, and they're always women, and say, "Hey, I heard this thing from relevant sources. I think you should know because it right. doesn't put you in a safe space." And I'm Not really sorry it's, no it's okay no go ahead it's just super fucked up that we that's the only way that we're able to protect young people or you know regardless of age protect people no in that's the case right you're talking about harassment for women i think that's that's actually the incredible thing is these conferences has have almost become this whisper network where right. women can actually talk to each other and say you know don't go there because I know that this person is not safe. I mean, that happened to me. I was applying to graduate schools and I was sitting there talking to people as they came up to my poster. And all of a sudden a graduate student came up from a program I was super interested in and said, don't come here. The person that you wanna work with is a rapist. I mean, I, it's it's insane and the only reason I knew that is because I went to that conference right and the thing is that people are you know because of the power imbalances there is very real and significant uh, repercussions for speaking out and obviously we so many stories in the news you know title nine issues at universities right. where people are not able to get justice despite having mountains of evidence and so obviously when you talk about grad students trying to help one another you know, like we always hear, it's like, oh, you want to vet the program before you decide to go somewhere. And it's always like, when I went to my, did my master's, like, oh, find your former students and email them to ask them about the professor. And you think right. it's confidential and it's real right. and it might be. Right. But if they don't, if they're not comfortable, like who wants right. to leave a paper trail right. incriminating themselves right. or, or revealing that they're the ones that incriminate somebody. And that happened to me. I emailed somebody about, about a professor. I received glowing remarks. Um, I ended up switching out of switching out of that advisor's lab because he was inappropriate and then I found out a year and a half later from a mutual friend that she she said she got this email from a prospective grad student and didn't know what to say so she didn't tell the truth and so like there's a lot to unpack there that's problematic and she shouldn't have done that because she you know I could have saved myself some hurt but it wasn't it wasn't what it wasn't to the level of what you just described he was not you know it wasn't that right. bad right but you know, you can't, how can you protect other people if there is no protection for yourself by speaking out on that? Yeah. And so that's why it's like, you know, if you're going to try to go to grad school and you're watching this and you're a woman, you're like, oh my God, like what the fuck am I supposed to do? Or any person, regardless of your gender, if you want to talk to somebody, it's always, always give somebody the option. Hey, would you be willing to like hop on the phone or zoom with me for five minutes to, you know, to talk? Because then it's like, there's not a paper trail. And maybe yeah. they're not comfortable speaking on a paper trail. Or maybe they don't want to just do Zoom because they don't want to do face-to-face. -face. But if right. you have the phone option, that creates like more safety for someone to walk up to you like that woman did and, and really help you protect yourself. Yeah. And it's hard for people in research groups. Um, I know a few people who have been in research groups with abusers and harassers who have been so um, abused, frankly, that they they cannot even speak out on their behalf, right? They've right. been subjected to so much shit that by the time they're asked questions, you know, maybe they defend the person or maybe they- They don't expect otherwise. Yeah, and it's, it's so, I mean, I have seen we can make this a little bit more general. I've seen so, so many people, more than I ever thought possible, be deterred from astronomy or physics because it's not safe. And that wow. fucking sucks. I mean, there are so many brilliant people I know, far, I mean, not to make it a comparison, but far more brilliant than I, who should have the same, like I had supportive mentors my entire time. And so I got super lucky. 
right? Like there are people who should have the same experience where what is important is your ability to learn stuff. Right. And, right. and the opportunity to be exposed to really interesting things. And unfortunately, I think, and this can be a broader sort of talk about academia and we don't have to make it that, but unfortunately it becomes this uh, broader thing where is this safe? Is there accountability for people that I interact with? Um, do I have any sort of support in the system? And more often than not, I think specifically in academia, the answer is no. Right, right. No, that's 100% true. And I, but I have to pause. I have to interrupt you because I, I feel like it's worth saying, like, because I feel this way as I'm watching you say this, and I'm sure you're, the viewers watching this also feel that way. You are having to ask yourself at every step of it, your education, just like so many other women, you are having to ask these questions yeah. about the environment in which you're trying to get your education and pursue your passion, which is right. fucking studying the exploding stars. And so yeah. you are literally dealing with all of this while studying exploding stars. There are whole demographics that all they get to do is study exploding stars. Right. You have to worry about all of this. And there are other demographics that have to worry about even more as a result of like, you know, power imbalances and social injustices. And realistically, what it comes down to is people in places of privilege. And I, and as a white woman, I know that I'm still in a place of privilege we don't realize how difficult people have to work how like people are treading water you know they're working so yeah. hard just to tread water whereas other people just were given flotation devices yeah i think that's a really work. good point and especially i mean if you think about it in terms of just like a finite amount of energy the people who have to think about these things <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Gardening over here. Not to call attention to it, but uh, that didn't look good. Um, but I, I think people's energy is being dispersed to things that we really wish we didn't have to disperse it to. Right. Um, I don't want to have to think about a potential stalker, or I don't want to have to think about, you know, whether I can go to my office because a predator is going to be there. Um, and it's not necessarily gender specific that said I think we can all sort of make the conclusion that it tends to be men and it tends to be white men that have this power um and that sucks <laughs> that makes it really difficult for young women young people of color young underrepresented minorities to get a foothold and to find their right. place I swear to God, I would not continue in astronomy if I did not have the advisors I did who encouraged me and said, your voice is not only welcome, we want it. You know, we find it valuable. If I didn't have that, I mean, besides the anxiety, the imposter syndrome, whatever, I don't think I would have done it. Right. I don't, I don't think I could have found it in myself to, to find that value in myself and say, I, I'm worth it to, to continue on. Right. And then we talk, you know, so often about why we have so much, you know, we, I'm not an expert on this, so I need to be careful how I say it. Cause I'm not, I don't want to take the microphone from people who are experts right. to deal with this, but we talk about the lack of diversity in like the wildlife field, for example. And what you just said summarizes just the tip of the iceberg for why this is so calm or why we have the issues that we have because people, if people never experience these things, they're not even aware of it or they're not advocating for you or advocating for your place. And if you are treated like you don't matter for whatever reason, because you're a woman, because you're being feti you know, fetishized, because you're being objectified, because you're being discriminated against, because of outright racism, of course people are either they're gonna leave because it's not safe or they don't believe they have worth. and you know, you add, add like complex issues, you know, like racism in the field and colonialism, which exists in my field, it exists across field, but it's right. obviously pervasive in the wildlife field. And, yeah. and it becomes a little more clear why we think, why, why we need, why people are talking about it. And it's not, you know, I, I see on Twitter people like, oh, you're just talking about stuff like this now because it's like politically correct. And it's like, no, these have been issues forever. Right. Some people are like who look like me are just late to the party. 
Right. No, and trying right. to make up for, you know, trying to do something to not be an, a passive or inactive. I didn't either, like, I don't want to be a passive bystander and I don't want to actively I, uh, per perpetuate bad things to happen to like people that I respect and, and love and like because they don't look like me. Yes. Um, and, you know, that doesn't make me special. That doesn't make me like a hero. I just think that's just like the. I don't know. Thing to do. Baseline for common decency. Like yeah. I, I don't know. It's not politically correct. It's not woke. It's not. It's just I don't know. Not being a shitty person. Yeah. And working on it, and that includes you know people listening. I feel like there are groups of people that get really uncomfortable. They like they don't want to talk about women in science. They don't want to talk about um, increasing diversity in STEM fields. And that's one of the reasons why I put that in the about for this. I was like everyone better be prepared that we're not, I mean, this isn't just, I mean, it is about science, but it's about more than that. It's about what it's like to be in science and what it's like to work in science. And does everyone have a place and how do we make it so that everyone has a place in science? Exactly. And I think, you know, people either don't want to talk about it because, you know, either it makes them uncomfortable because they've never been confronted with that before, to which I don't realistically have a lot of sympathy for, because these conversations, like if the worst about this conversation is that I am you know, uncomfortable, how, I just imagine how much privilege that, that reveals, you know what I mean? Like I'm uncomfortable talking about something. I'm not living it. You know what I mean? Obviously in the case of we're talking about like women in science and, 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 you know, harassment and stuff like that, that obviously I can relate to, and that makes me uncomfortable and those things have happened to me and that sucks. But, you know, when we take it a step further, you know, if you're going to take, or if you're going to take a step back and say, well, this hasn't happened to me, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be listening to the conversations because that not only does that, that doesn't mean just because it hasn't happened to you, doesn't mean that you can't help it not happen to somebody else. And it also doesn't mean that you played zero role in enabling that to happen to somebody right. else. Maybe, you know, you, if, if you're a man listening to this conversation, you have a colleague that, you know, always interrupts their female colleagues or they make, you know, inappropriate comments about their female colleagues, like tell them shut the fuck up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's just simple stuff like that, like simple, small acts add up to make the world a better place. And so it's like, sure, great. You never raped a woman. Awesome. Really glad. Appreciate that. But like, that's a really, really, really slow bar to, to set. And I can guarantee you, you know, someone in your life that has pushed the boundaries for whatever particular social interest you want to talk about. And so by just simply saying, hey man, that's not cool. Or, you know, hey Karen, knock it off. You know what I mean? Like stuff uh, like that. And I just feel like, you know, those are conversations. We all need to be having those conversations regardless of whether or not we're directly impacted by whatever the case may be. Yeah. And I think it takes people with a certain level of privilege to be able to have conversations that make change because unfortunately those people of privilege have positions of power right. that are able to enact said change. And so it takes white women, it takes um, men, it takes cis men, it takes, you know, these groups that hold said power to have uncomfortable conversations and say, look, right. science sucks sometimes because I can't go out in the field because I'm too scared of being raped by someone right. or I can't go to a conference because I'm too afraid of um, being taken advantage by someone. Right. And that's not exactly. fair. That's not, that's not the point of science. The point mm -hmm. of science is to discover truths. And I'm curious what your answer is to discover truths about the universe in which we live. And, um, better understand them yeah I think for me science is about drinking really good beer fuck yeah no I'm just kidding yes. actually I'm That's not drinking good beer right now you um, when, we, answer we, than mine. When, when we uh dialed up for a shifting gears when we dialed up for quarantine we're like we have to like buy as many groceries as we can for like you know a month like fresh and canned stuff or dry goods like beans and whatever but I also don't want like what happens if the, if the if like the alcohol store closes like what if I would like to drink a beer <laughs> So I went out and, you know, but I also love a grad budget. Like I'm not living like a super fancy life. So I, um, <laughs> same currently. Oh drinking. yes. Which this is not the same beer that you drank as an undergrad. The beer that you drank as an undergrad and that I drank as an undergrad was things like Natty Light and yeah. Bush Light, which That's is right. truly just water with a tiny drop of urine in it. 
This is correct. Um, Cora's Banquet is the uh, fancy beer because it is brewed with 100% Rocky Mountain water since 1873. This is also not an advertisement. I'm just talking out of my ass here. Um, I love this beer because it really, we started drinking this when we were in Amarillo, uh, Texas during our master's and we went to this like fancy we're brewing in restaurant. Amarillo? Yeah, I went to West Texas A&M for my master's. I just wrote an entire like I don't know, four pages specifically about West Texas in my chapter because I love West Texas. I It's beautiful. Work. Oh my God. That said, the cities in West Texas are like a whole different breed, but it's, I it's they're like old shoes. It's bad. Yes. Yes. Also, congratulations on submitting your book analogy. chapter. It's true. But congratulations on submitting your book chapter. It's fucking awesome. This, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, well, let's like couch that by saying, Sorry to get alcohol. Um, I I emailed my literary agent yesterday and I was like, Jessica, I'm pretty sure everything I'm written is bad. <laughs> it's like, well, it sounds um, like grad school. <laughs> and the problem is, I've already written like double double space, like almost thirty pages, and I was like. I, should I just continue or do I stop? Like, do I burn it? <laughs> yeah. And that's totally fine. I mean, I've gone to a point today, like with the numerous sort of, the problem is I go to bed thinking about my book and then I wake up thinking about my book and I'm just like, it's all I can think about. Um, so I've just edited the shit out of this book, which sucks because I am sure I'm going to have to rewrite all of it. Oh yeah. I read something like that. I wrote like two years ago and I'm like, are you a scientist? This is terrible. No, it's it's like aggressively not good in parts of it. We're also our own worst critic. I know, so. I know, I know. But on the other hand, I'm like, you know, but like, I don't want to read about this. Certainly nobody else wants to read about it. But the point is I started talking about um, West Texas because the McDonald Observatory is in West Texas. Oh, right, 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 right. It's like two hours outside of Big Bend. I don't know where you, you were in Amarillo. Okay. My husband's uh, master's research was right outside of Big Bend. Okay, cool. So we did field oh. work out there. And there's like a bunch of weird lights that. Oh my God, Marfa lights. Marfa yeah. lights. There you go. The Marfa yeah. lights. We yeah, saw. yeah, yeah. No, it's. It's the it's Chupacabra. Um, yeah, I think so. People try to ascribe them to aliens. And I'm like, guys, just like, it's headlights. Come on. It's not aliens. It's weird it's monsters <laughs> that are mammals. Like. <laughs> I, yes, it is clearly that that <laughs> must be it. yes um that said I I mean I think so West Texas Big Ben was the first national park I ever went to I spent it's a beautiful time. Place. it is if any of the viewers ever want to go to a national park there are some really amazing ones but I will always say go to Big Bend I mean it's like it's a beautiful place and so well, where we were in Amarillo, well, we were actually in Canyon, which is named after Palo Duro Canyon. And so it's the second largest canyon system in the entire United States. So you have like- Wait, what is flat, it called? Yeah, so like, you know, Amarillo is like flat grassland, like short grass prairie, like cattle country, you know? It's like literally stopover habitat as you're driving from like oh. Houston to like New Mexico, anywhere. Um, but this, it just, the, there's the Yana, the Yana Staccato and it just drops down in this beautiful cavern system. It's a state park, but it literally is a miniature Grand Canyon. It's phenomenal and beautiful. That's where I, that's where I did my master's research. It's so beautiful. It's amazing. And it's actually funny because I started talking about wildlife in my chapter. I mean, I had like a, like a little blurb about javelinas and I was like, I mean, a lot of people who drive those roads run into javelinas and their cars are fucked like they're I, they're so cute I love how they live for like, like 20 years <laughs> they're not okay they're not they're it's but the cool thing about the observatory that I was at is it's the darkest skies in the U.S. so you can see I mean it looks like you're looking through clouds because you are literally looking at our galaxy it is That's so I had no idea believable if you ever want to see stars and planets oh that's so cool galaxy. i didn't think about that the most beautiful place that i've ever seen stars and so that's without like just with the naked eye like nothing about planets was up in um 
Flathead National Forest, which is about 30 minutes, I guess, southeast of Glacier National Park in winter. That makes so sense. It was a clear night. It was beautiful. Like you've never, it's you've never sense. seen anything. And so yeah. I have the Twitter up right now because I'm, I'm trying to pay attention to comments. So if you're watching, you have to drop into the comments, like where is the prettiest place that you, or the where have you been where you've seen the clearest like night sky? Yeah. Like the most stars or planets, whether it's with the naked eye or with like a telescope. I think McDonald Observatory for me. So it's right outside of Fort Davis, which is, like I'm trying to give it landmarks that make sense. So like four hours away from Odessa, Texas. I mean, that's like West fucking Texas. Like there's nothing around. There is nothing. I mean, you look up, you think it's clouds. It's the galaxy. It's the milky. Oh my God, that's a cat. <laughs> Introduce. He's not pleased. I mean. Look at his asshole. This is, his name is Chopsticks, but he goes. Chopsticks. Oh my God, that's a good name. He's gorgeous, but he's a huge dick. And he beats up our, he beats up <laughs> Rio, who's not in this part of the house right now. Otherwise I'd introduce him, but he actually is very happy right now because he's a mama's boy, but he really, really just, his resting bitch face is really, he's just a whole movie. He guy. has a, I don't know if it's the slant of the eyes or what, but like he has a fucking attitude. He looks pissed. All right, so pit, let's see. So some of the responses for like beautiful places, I'm seeing Pisgah National Forest, uh, which is beautiful. Um, Bam. Uh, it's Bam. chopsticks, not chapsticks, but I love it. <laughs> um, Bam see, is, the cat is always pissed. Joshua Tree. I've never been to Joshua Tree. I've never been to Banff National Park. Banff is probably the second most beautiful place I've ever been to. I went there a year, almost exactly a year ago. And the, I mean, really, Imogene, you have to go. The mountains are like, you have never, I mean, I don't know, maybe you've seen, but I have never seen mountains like that. It was like glacier on steroids. It was every mountain is a new mountain. They're all different. Holy I all. shit. I mean, it was unbelievable. Mount Graham in Arizona. Um, someone's cat is an astrophysicist. See, you know, we're eventually we're gonna figure out how to intersect cats in space, other than just <laughs> memes on Twitter. Um Carlsbad Caverns is also a great place. I went there as, when I was at the observatory and it was really cool. So I did this weird thing where, all right, I'm, I'm spoiling my book that is unwritten, but it's fine. Um, so I had a car that I thought I could drive really fast and I, I still have said car and I think I can drive it really fast, but I didn't understand <laughs> the repercussions were driving it fast. So I drove this Volkswagen R32. For those of you who know what that is, it's like a golf, but on steroids, it's like a Volkswagen golf on steroids. It is fucking fast. You can go 120 without like sweating. Like it's easy. anybody else like seriously crushing on her. She studies stars and has like no, I, race cars. I, I love cars. <laughs> it's a weird obsession. I think my dad loves cars. Therefore I love cars. Fair. Um, okay. So I'm at the observatory and I'm like, I need to do something with my weekend. I'd already gone to big Ben twice. I was like, all right, I'm going to Carlsbad. It is four to six hours away, depending on how long you take. Like, that's fine. I did a day trip. So I drove <laughs> like two and a half hours. I was averaging 130 on my in my car. I the, wait. So I was averaging 130. I was like, hey, no. <laughs> I was going, and I decided to stop at Guadalupe Guadalupe Forest, and it was. I mean, it was like some of the best forestry that you've ever seen. I took a small hike, and then I was like, all right, I got to go to the caverns. Went to the caverns had an amazing time. There were, I learned at the time, but I don't remember the difference between stalagmites and stalactites. And it was, I mean, it's, it's very different for me as a like space scientist looking at science on a small scale. And right. so trying to understand the difference between them and trying to understand how light impacts, like the same things that I care about. Mm -hmm small scale scientists care about. And so 
thinking about that as I was going through that was really cool. And then I raced back to the McDonald's Observatory to try to get back for dinner. Really? Like, <laughs> yeah, no, it was like, it was, well, it was crazy. So <laughs> the point is I woke up the next morning at like 10 AM or eight, whatever. And my entire body was sore. Like every part of me was sore because I was gripping the steering wheel so hard because I was driving the car so fast that I was trying not to <laughs> fucking crash. And it was by far the, the fastest I'd ever gone. I think I pushed like 132 and I was like, I'm done. I'm never doing this again. And now oh. I like I'll hit 80 and I'm like, all right, I'm going good. <laughs> like that's so it. For those of you who have not lived in Texas, there are really high speed limits in many parts of Texas. So realistically you weren't even going that fast. Yes. Well, that's what I thought. <laughs> that's exactly, literally that's what I told myself. I was like, oh, the speed limit here is 85, 95. That's fine. That's like a guideline. <laughs> it was not, but I had a car that could handle it. Do not recommend for any viewers. Um, but I had a great time. I got to see the caverns. I got to go back to the stars that night. And it was, I mean, it's insane. You can see, I'm trying to think of the things you can see out there. It's like, yeah, it's like literally. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's like seeing like, if you were to pour sea salt on your like desk um, and you step kind of far away, Every bit of sea salt is a galaxy and you can see all of them at one time. That is such a good, that's such a poetic metaphor. Oh my God, thanks. I came up with it. Write joke. that down for the book. <laughs> yeah. That's no, so I good. <laughs> Which I will buy, by the way. Oh my God, thanks. No, I, my agent will be very happy. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's wild. I mean, it's crazy. The amount of things you can see out there and you're just you're, you're struck. I mean, the, the, the way that I act when I see things like that, I mean, I think about people I've been in love with. You can think about falling in love and what that feels like and the sort of relationship you have. That, no, that's a beautiful way to, to say it. I think that some of the, I'm not a, per, I don't study that I, I don't study that. I don't study that at all. It's hard to like, how do I say that? I said, I don't study that part of the universe. Um, but I think some of those beautiful experiences that I have had have been looking up at the night sky and someone who doesn't study that part of the universe or study that aspect of it without having like a, a, an under, a firm understanding of it. I still very intimately understand that when I look up at the night sky on a clear night, it makes me it makes me realize how incredibly small I am. And I don't feel, and I don't say that in like a, in an, it's like the one time that like the, it's, I'm not talking about an inferiority complex. So I think like, well, so my favorite song in the entire world probably is by an artist called Bonnie Vare. He's got a song called Holocene. I watched. Oh, him. I love Holocene. I watch the music video yeah. every time on my birthday and I cry. It's just a weird thing that I do. I, I um, I, there's actually, if you're into that song, so the song's beautiful. The music video is amazing. Um, but someone it's on YouTube. Someone took the track and they lifted the lyrics out. So it's just, it's truly instrumental. So it's he not like a violin it. pretending Mine. to the lyrics. They literally lifted the track out or the lyrics out, the, the singing out. Mine, so that, but, this is your job <laughs> that was the that was the processional at our wedding that was what we walked down the aisle to yeah uh, that's how much I love the song but my favorite line in the song where he sings that when he realizes that he wasn't that he's not magnificent and I I love that like it's not like I guess some people could hear that and, and feel so sad like oh I'm not the center of the universe but I feel like like looking up at the night sky or being out in nature, whether it's the daytime or the nighttime is like that. Cause you're like standing on a mountain overlooking a vista or you're even like in a, a just a Creek and there's not even a beautiful view. And you realize like how like insignificant you are and just like the way the world turns and, and all of these things that have happened. Like, who am I compared to like an exploding star? Like, what am I compared to like, an entire planet that was underwater and created what is now mountains that are just these beautiful towers in the sky that I'm just like a tiny little piece of. Um, hi, and I have to, some people said, I'm like, hey, 
Hey, baby. Hello. Here, this is Rio. He likes ice cubes, so he knows that I have one. You want some ice? He's like, I heard you were talking about the universe and saying deep I, shit, so I decided to come in here and screw it up a little. Here. I tried to give Comet ice once, and he basically had a seizure. I mean, he freaked out. Like, he liked it? He, 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 he did his puppy bow. He was like, I don't know what to do with this. <sighs> He's outside with Taylor right now, or I'd show you guys, but don't worry, he's coming. His best. Rio loves ice. Um, does your dog like carrots? Here, I'm just gonna give you all the ice. I don't just know. Take, take it all, buddy. If you hear some slurping sounds, it's my dog. Um, so like a lot of dogs like carrots. My dog hates carrots, but what he does love is he loves entire cabbage leaves. <laughs> I know you said that last time. Oh, I did say that last time. time. Yeah, he's just weird. weird. He, yeah, he just, what is that? Why do dogs like cat? I mean, that's, weird. he also eats cat poop though. So I don't, I'm not going to go too deep into trying to figure out like what it is he actually likes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, Mari's going to probably try to roll in fox shit in like the local park. So what can you do? I think Each their own. just to go back to the perspective thing purely because I can, I can literally say the same thing over and over probably until I die. And I, so I realized as I've gotten older, I don't know if it's because I have anxiety that I feel this way mm -hmm. and I've had it for a long time. And this is the only outlet that I've had. But if I see the sky and I realize how small we are, suddenly I feel so much better. Right. See, because my pro oh that's a baby Sorry. no <laughs> that's a baby <laughs> um suddenly all of the problems that we have and all of the things that we struggle with oh my god look at that snoot you gotta give him a pet you he's not him. supposed to table graze yet here we are <laughs> what can idea. you expect it's true sorry okay but yes no i think that's relevant and i think that that's like God, it's so amazing about science, right? Like we talk about this like heavy shit, but like science, like whatever your version is, that exactly it's whatever you. your version is, it doesn't fucking matter. And it's worth pursuing. Like I, you know, I said like when I talk to young people, like oh, like really loving dolphins or really loving snow leopards is sadly not enough to get you that right. dream job or position. Right. That's and right. There's, and there's reasons to say that, and I feel. I feel shitty saying that because I am in this really cool position. Um, the only reason I'm in this position, like I said last week, is because I have specific skill sets that are necessary right now. And, you know, we talk about having, being realistic and having important skill sets and like being useful for science or basically making yourself applicable to science. But you can still be mindful of all those things and still never let go of what you just said, which was like that very visceral emotion that ties you to what you do and makes it something that you have to pursue. Yeah. And, I, and it's hard to let those two exist simultaneously because society um, works so incredibly hard to eliminate that. Um, for I think colleges. it's, again, I don't know if it's, I just have a very hard time picking up on social cues, but I really don't give a shit if someone is not excited about what I'm excited about if I care about stars I'm going to yell it from the rooftops because I think right. it's awesome and yeah, maybe, sorry go ahead. well I just I think you know there is this understood sort of etiquette in at least in astronomy where yes we all love the universe we all love space but we don't all have to like fawn over it and I'm over here kind of saying like, yeah, we should, why not? This stuff why is not? awesome. Let's all appreciate it for what it is and communicate it for what it is because we get other people excited about it just as much as I am. And this is not like, I'm not playing this stuff up. I think this stuff is awesome. And I mean, that's, like that's what it, despite all the math, despite all of the, you know, papers that are written, it's cool because it's there and we get to be able to understand it based on how we understand science. And that's right. amazing. No, it is. And I think it's so frustrating because like, I mean, do you, do you think that you were always like that? Do you think you always had the confidence to be like, fuck it, I don't care if other people are 
don't think it's cool to be that excited. Cause I don't think that I had used to have that confidence at all. Oh, I think my personality was at odds. Like I, I think I had both. I, okay. um, as this frankly brown girl nerd whose parents, my, my mom had a PhD, my dad had two masters. I was raised in an academic, oh my God, sorry, comment is like freaking out. Um, I was raised in an academic household where I was not rewarded, but I was um, encouraged to have thoughts like this. So I distinctly, distinctly remember I went to an Episcopalian school growing up um, and I remember first grade, I went to chapel and my pastor talked about how the universe was made. And I remember coming back home and saying, well, if God made the universe, then who made God and who made that God? And I remember sitting in the car in my garage and having this conversation with my parents and the best thing, you know, my parents had a fucked up marriage. The best thing that they did is they said, that's a great question, Serafina. Why don't you think about it? And I thought about it. And I, I mean, Holy shit, that's great. no, it, it was amazing. And I, I obviously don't have an answer, but there was this in atmosphere of encouragement of saying, you know, let's question things that we're faced with. Right. And really, I mean, you know, people ask when I fell in love with space and it's, it's so cheesy, but the answer is like from, you know, as far as I can remember when I had a fucking conscience, I like thought about it and I was trying to understand how we got here, how we, you know, are we supposed to be here? What is the fate of the universe? How do we reconcile those two? And trying to understand our role in society as a result of that. And there is a sort of innate, I think, curiosity that I've never lost. And if someone tries to dissuade me by saying science is math and you need to, you know, buckle down and, and, and run your models or publish papers or whatever it is, right. I mean, you know, there is this publish or perish thing. Right. And I'm basically just like, I don't care. Like I, right. and I have okay. the privilege, you know, I, I, I am a white passing woman and I have the privilege of saying like, I'm going to do what I want because I want to do it. And, right. um, I find these questions really fascinating and I'm going to try to answer them. Yeah, but I feel like some of the people that are also that are critical about like, you know, oh, Serafina, calm down, it's just math, uh, or whatever the case may yeah. be. I mean, I'm thinking, oh my God, math is terrifying, but not when you frame it this way. And so like, I feel like as a, as a, per, as a child who, I didn't excel in math. Um, I was basically I, told I was- I also did not excel in math. And so it's a great example of why, Okay. I, I think it's a great example because like, first of all, like I, if you had told me like 10 years ago that I would be a geneticist, I would have laughed in your face because I went to tutor every day in undergrad and I got a D yep. dog in genetics 101. Yep. And I was like, genetics is boring. I hate it. Why the fuck would yep. I ever study that? And now it's like my life. I think about everything in the context of like population structure. and connectivity. That is so cool. <laughs> you know what I'm because it be it, because eventually it came to me in a way that was digestible and interesting to me. So like if we eliminate the spark that makes people excited, we're eliminating the thing that makes yes. them be That's able right. to understand something. That's right. And so like you know, and I know that I'm pivoting a lot. Like I see someone like math like a heart in the comments. You know, some people love math. Like I didn't excel. Wow. See someone I didn't excel in math, and I'm getting my PhD in math. Like I didn't do well in math. I was told that I didn't do well in math. And at one point like, I switched schools and they're like, oh, oh like you're in eighth grade, but you need to retake seventh grade math. Yep. You're not good at it. And so I'm glad I retook it because I needed to like catch up on some stuff. But basically that created this whole like circular mindset my whole life of I'm not good at math. And so like, if you had explained certain things like you just did in the context of math, I'm like, holy shit, math is great. It's not just numbers hiding secrets. 
you know, it's like revealing secrets or it's cool or whatever, or like yeah. it doesn't suck. It's super interesting. And I feel like if you allow people to understand things in the way that it naturally comes to them, then the yes. world is a lot better place. I mean, the same goes for like, for like religion as well. Like I, you know, I grew up in a Sali, I grew up in a, uh, one side of the family was, was, was Christian. One side wasn't, was, was more apathetic. Uh, or agnostic. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had the privilege of working in different parts of, of Central Asia and been a guest in so many different people's homes. And I've been invited into these temples that I don't deserve to be in realistically. And, you know, I feel like faith, you know, just like at science, like faith comes to people in ways that they understand it. So the idea that like, there's only one way to do anything or digest or believe anything doesn't make sense to me because we're all so incredibly different. And I, you know, obviously I, I'm not trying to like have a religious discussion. I'm just saying that there are so many different things in our life that are essential to who we are, or even just conceptual to like navigating a day to day that if we are able to allow people to be excited, then they'll, they'll be more invested in their life or they'll be more engaged or they'll just be more. Or they'll engaged. pursue things that. Or they'll, exactly, exactly. Exactly. Like maybe, you know, if, you know, if I had known that I could be good at math or that math would make sense if A, B, and C had happened, or if I had had different tutors or been encouraged, you know, if right. I was an issue with people, young people in STEM, then maybe certain things would be different. Maybe things would come faster. I would have just like made career decisions sooner. Um, you know, it is what it is. No, you can't have cat food. Go away. Go away. Sorry. <laughs> I, my 10th grade year, so it's not that I loved math I I knew I wanted to do astronomy since I was four but when I was a middle schooler I remember asking I mean I started in middle school and I remember asking the dean I was like can I take astrophysics because it was a, a class offered for 11th and 12th graders and I was I was in sixth grade and she was like no <laughs> like you do not know like get the math like throw all the fuck up and not not do that and I honestly I kind of took her critique and I was like that's fine and I uh used it to fuel how much as I was excited about that's awesome me. and by the time I got to 11th grade, I was like, fuck yeah. Like I am ready. I've been waiting. I'm so ready. I'm so ready. And I mean, I, it's not that I did the best in that class. I, I was not by far the best, but I remember I loved it. I loved every aspect of it. That said, awesome. when I got to 10th grade, my algebra two teacher, he was this like, I don't know, early fifties sort of white guy who had taught math for ages. He was like, you know, some of you are going to grow up to do math and some of you are not. And here are the people I predict. Here are the people who are. And lo and behold, all of the people he predicted were men all of the people he predicted were white and the rest of us kind of sat there like, okay. But the, pro the, the problem is that I didn't even question it. I was like, yeah, I know that makes sense. Like I can't do it. Yeah. Like I'm not good at it. And it was that year. It was my 10th grade year where I, my friend, had a tutor and I picked that I I tagged along she was another Arab American woman and she was Muslim she covered herself she was like not not the typical sort of like American high school girl that you would sort of see and she did the due diligence of looking for a tutor that made sense for her and I I tagged along I was like yeah like count me in and I worked for this tutor my entire high school years. And I swear to God, I would not be where I am if I had That's not awesome. worked with him. I found a teacher who was able to communicate in varying degrees and varying levels right. to where I was. And that is, yeah, it works. And it's that's important. that's what a teacher is supposed to do. It's right. not to dissuade people. And it's certainly not to dissuade people based on what you think they should be. 
Right. No, exactly. I 100% agree with that. And that was, sh- I mean, that was so new to me. I mean, when he said, so I, I actually triple majored at the beginning of my degree, I triple majored in math, physics, and astronomy. And to him, that, that <laughs> so absurd and awesome. Well, it is, it is, it is absurd. It's, Not, I mean, in a critical way, I just be like, I said, oh my gosh, no, it is. It's dumb. so amazing. Like, why did I do that? I don't know. Like, I, because <laughs> you're I'm amazing. I don't know. But to him, that made total sense. And to my, to my algebra two teacher, he was like, what the fuck are you doing in this? <sighs> And it was this, I mean, I remember going back to him and telling him like, yeah, man, I am doing it. And I told him I'm an astronomy major. And he was like, yeah, good luck. And there was this sort of expectation of you have to look a certain way. You have to be a certain way. You have to think a certain way. And everything else is not even not accepted you're not even able to do it right and that's, if you don't have a penis that's a problem if you have boobs it's definitely a problem yeah no that's right that's exactly we haven't even right. talked about what it means if you're not white right right that's right and and i don't have the qualifications to be able to have that conversation no but no. that's exactly right right and so to be able to navigate that is impossible to some extent you just kind of have to luck into the allies that you have and say I hope you know I hope you get me through I hope that you have as much confidence in me as I you know have passion for this thing right and that's what happened to me is I had amazing mentors who said you clearly love the stars. Like, let me try to get you to a place where you can understand that. Let's do it. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, but unfortunately that's not, that's not the case for everyone. No, it's certainly not. And it's, it's hard. It's, I I feel it's difficult when you have, I feel like so much, sorry, so much conversation on Twitter has kind of shifted to how do we have conversations that are realistic for people that are younger than us. And I know that like I'm 33, I'm not that old, Um, but how do you have conversations that are realistic about any of these issues uh, to young people, whether it's like financial ceilings or, you know, discrimination in the field or, you know, health, you know, health concerns or safety concerns you have to worry about. Um, And I haven't figured out how to answer that, but it's something that, you know, I think is kind of always in the back of my mind. It's like, you know, we have, so many people who want to do these things and we have limitless questions, but we have limited funding. And so then it becomes the hierarchical um, arms race of like who gets to do it. And, you know, like, was it last week, you know, National Science Foundation graduate research program results came back in and, you know, a lot of people didn't get to hear what they wanted to hear. And, you know, that's one way by which people measure their success. And it's super frustrating because obviously that's not realistic. Um, but we can't like, it's hard. It's still hard to, it's hard to like couch that in the same statement as yes, but you still need funding in order to pursue these things that you're passionate about. And so like, I wish I had better answers for people who haven't yet gotten to do what they want to do. It took me two years to get into a master's program. And I remember just being like so anxious and upset, like and stressed out all the time. And looking back, it was like a really easy time in my life compared to like just life now, just because I'm older and I have more responsibilities, blah, blah, blah. Um, And realistically, like another year would have been okay. It's not what I wanted, but another year would have been okay. Like, you know, now like that type of flexibility is is not something I'm able to afford quite as easily. But I, you know, I wish that I had, I guess like knowing some of the things that I know now, but I wish that I had been able to, I wish I like still understanding the angst of not getting what you want and not being, yeah. able to get. I, you know, I, I don't, I haven't forgotten what that's like. So I know that I'm speaking from like a place of like, I've gotten a lot of things that I want, um, not expense free, not hassle free, but I've gotten some of the things that I want professionally and personally in my life. And so it's hard to talk about like, those struggles in some ways because it's still a high-handed conversation because I've overcome some of those things and you know that makes it kind of difficult 
Comment. What's difficult in your life? I'm I'm trying so hard to be silent and show comment. And no, he's I, comment. Comment. Come on. Comment. I don't know, mom. I don't like this. He's not. He's. Not. I'm not into. Oh, I like that mirror though. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. No, it was on sale. That's a cool mirror. I snatched it up. Um. Okay. I do not want to go three hours again because. There. It's 11 o'clock now. Should we answer some questions or make sure that we have addressed them all? Let's let's do a lightning round. So oh, yes. Let's do that. I like it. We have already questions built up in our sort of mods have, have done their job and been amazing. But if you have any other questions, please write them. Write them down. Send them to us. We're going to start going. Um, okay. I'm going to start from the- I'm going to start by saying that is like- that's bronzer. Do you see that? Look at that. My name is Imogen and I just took a giant crayon oh, and said, yeah, Cheers. No, I see it. I see it. It <laughs> looks like a shadow. It looks good. Fine. That's it's right. just Imogen being bad at makeup. Apparently. Imogen, at this point, we've done two hours inside of three. And I think we might need to have our own show because <laughs> I would be down for that. Are you kidding me? You're killing it. <laughs> We could do this once a week as, and even if no one watched, even if no one else hung out with us, I'd be completely happy. I'd be fine. Yeah. Okay. So maybe we do this in addition to drunk science. Okay. So we're Can I just like, I'm jumping out. Someone asked, uh, Gary says, what are your thoughts on the GRE as a measuring stick for grad school? I think it's stupid, bullshit. man. It's so bullshit. Dumb. I, I, my GRE score is worth the bare minimum to get into my department. I retook it. I took it twice the first time, then my scores expired, then I took it again, and my score only increased 10 points. Yeah. My boyfriend I don't want to get test taker at all. My boyfriend is currently trying to take the GRE for his, or he is taking the GRE for his business degree, and um, he hates it, and he keeps it's asking stupid. questions, and I'm like, it's so dumb. <laughs> like I, I could not, well, the problem is I didn't take it seriously when I applied. I was like, this is so stupid. If anyone doesn't like take a, and there is a level of privilege here, but I was like, this is like, I'm not going to go to a program that doesn't accept me because I didn't get a high GRE score. This is stupid. I got turned down from a lot of programs because I was flat out told like, look, you don't need the minimum threshold for this department. I don't, I don't know why I got turned down from several programs, but I am sure it is related to my GRE score. And I mean, that's fine, you know, but like, it's fine that they wanted that, but I think the problem yeah. is that you're there, you're cheating yourself you're, as a person who's hiring people. You're cheating yourself out of hugely talented people. Well, because is it really good at taking a test? Doesn't mean you don't like. Doesn't mean that you're not capable of asking good questions. Exactly. No, I mean, I totally. Looks like most people agree. Okay. Let's see what else? Okay. It looks like the votes are in, and we should definitely have our own show. <laughs> I'm so fucking down. I'm so down um interstellar thumbs up or thumbs down down very so down was very, that the was that the movie where like the promo poster was like matt damon in a spacesuit yeah well there was the martian that was, that was martian okay. okay so matt but but matt damon i i think was also in interstellar yes yes sorry my my partner is is okay. <laughs> acknowledging everything i said um the problem with interstellar that I have is that, yeah, no, I'm going there. The main woman in that fucking movie, her whole character arc was intrinsically enti like entwined to her being in love with the concept of being in love. She was like, I am in love with this person and therefore I must do this thing. And I was like, are you serious? I'm pretty sure on? that's not something I've ever said to my husband. Come on, man. Like, that's not okay. I was so mad. I was so mad. I'm not, I'm not. Yeah. It. Anyway. But a woman, no woman's character arc is supporting. Yes, it. exactly. That is not fair. Not that supporting. Not, it. Like, not fair. Not fair. Not. Um, uh, someone said, do cats get cancer? Yes, um, they do. So when I worked at a tiger sanctuary, we had a cat that, um, we euthanized that had pink, was it pancreatic cancer? Fuck. We did a new, we did an autopsy and like, they had an organ that was like twice the size of what it should so they have were, been. They were dead. I think, yeah, I think it was the pancreas. 
Do you, okay, so oh yeah, sorry, my, they were dead. Yeah, they were dead when we like opened them up. You have a hard time talking about cancer based on your family. No, I think uh, for two reasons, three reasons. Um, well, the first reason is that my grandfather was a radiologist and my grandmother is was a nurse, and so I grew up in this very like matter of fact medical family. Um, and so like that's the first thing. The second thing is that I you know Alzheimer's also runs in my family, um, and so like it's kind of like one of those things that it deeply terrifies me, but, and I think it deeply terrifies everybody in my family. Cause like it, like my great grandmother had it and it's supposed to allegedly be more correlated to skipping generations. And so like my mom is one of five. So the reality is that maybe one of the five of them could get it. Um, and I think women get it more. My, there's only two girls. And so my mom is one of them. So like, we're kind of all terrified of it. So we just kind of joke about it. So like my mom would be like, who are you? Again, it's so obviously if, if you've been touched by Alzheimer's, like I'm not trying to diminish that, like my family has, it's really scary, but we try to be matter of fact about it because there's only so much you can do to like combat nature anyways. And so I feel like those things have set me up for being just like, it is what it is. Like my mom's had cancer, my dad's going undergoing chemo. Um, I haven't had it myself. And so that's like a, a bystander coping mechanism. Imogene, I know we talked about your parents having it. Are you nervous for yourself no I don't think so not really I mean no I don't know I mean like we talked about a little bit of that like last week I've got I've gotten some screenings like I had an ovarian cyst last summer um right. that you know I had to get checked out just mostly because it I was like really it just put me in the ER at, like in between international trips and we didn't know what it was and it wasn't like emergent or anything like that. And I don't have any of the um, underlying conditions that some other people in my family have had, um, but I haven't had some of the genetic tests done yet outside. I get regular screenings, but I haven't had genetic tests for it. Um, so I don't know. I, I mean, I guess obviously there's not really an excuse for me not to have had it done by now. So maybe that's like a bit of a denial thing. But I don't know, like, I guess we always joke in my family that like, some, you're going to die at some point anyways. And I don't, I don't have like this, like live fast and die hard kind of attitude. I think it's fucking stupid. Um, and just having listened to parents that have, you know, dealt with illness <laughs> in their life. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know. Like, I guess I, I haven't thought about cancer and like my genetic and biological predisposition for it as it affects me at a young age. And so like, right, so it's not the condition of being young that like, it doesn't ever happen to you. Yeah. Like, exactly. like I'm 33. Right. So in terms of like getting some of these, you know, I'm like, I'm considered yeah. old. Yeah. I'm like, in terms of maternal, uh, like age, I'm well, old. Sure, but that's still young. I mean, right. I'm, right, like 33 is young as fuck. 33 is young, thank you, some days. <laughs> no, um, it's young. I, I don't know. Like, I guess I worry about Alzheimer's. I worry about like being the old lady in like the nursing home. And like, I'm always like jet, like I'm always like trying to figure out how to ask somebody to like pluck my chin hair, but I can't. I, I have Alzheimer's. pluck my chin hair, so it's fine. <laughs> you, know, you know, but like also, I don't know. Like, I feel like maybe that's my, maybe like that's my coping mechanism is like, I don't know how I'm going to escape it outside of modern medicine. And also just like, trying to like handle it as emotion like be as honest as I can about it emotion like yes it's scared but like let's try to laugh a little bit before right. there's no one to laugh with maybe is that dark no that's beautiful I think I mean I, you know obviously you have more experience and you know I don't know like I don't know what it's like for you hearing about that like obviously having had your you know you had a huge fucking year with this and like how does how has that changed your life I think I have some cognitive dissonance with it. Like there right. is, you know, my dad has, is going to die from cancer. And I have a, <laughs> a very large likelihood of, 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 of having cancer. That said though, I think for me specifically, there are so many screenings out there, not for pancreatic, but for ovarian, but for breast that I am most at risk for that make it way less scary. I mean, if you're doing the screenings, you're going to catch it. And if you catch it, you have a far more, like a far better chance of, of defeating it. 
you know, if you catch it like my dad did, where it was already stage four, it's a lot harder. Um, for me, I think what I've learned is the bet the the earlier you catch it, the better your odds are. And I I I think that's true for most cancers. I could be wrong, but that I think that's true. I mean, pancreatic cancer is obviously the really scary one. Right. My master's advisor passed away last year from the complication of pancreatic cancer. And yeah. he had no idea until he just had it. And it was stayed, you know, it's almost always like stage four yeah. and people come back from it. Yeah. And I think, so for a BRCA too, that is an increased risk. And it's unfortunate, obviously, because of the mortality rate. But it's also unfortunate because a lot of people don't know the symptoms. Sorry, comment is like, please right play with me. No. <laughs> You can talk about cancer or you can throw oh, this tennis I ball. Can talk about my dog. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Look at his there little floppy ears. Is. He's, he's so ready. Um, oh, he's very cute. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think there is this sort of expectation that if you have pancreatic cancer, you die. And there are certainly people who, who do not. But it's an uncomfortable topic, and it's one that um, I'm nervous to talk about because I'm nervous about it for myself. And so I didn't know that BRCA2 increased your risk for pancreatic cancer. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually specifically BRCA2. It's not BRCA1. Which it's is a not genetic. Bad. That's so, it, that's strange. Yeah, I don't know enough about biology to be able to say why. Um, but... Again, I mean, I'm sorry, but there are symptoms like there, there are for everything and you can, you know, design them however you want. Right. But my grandma who had pancreatic cancer, she had ovarian, she survived and then she got pancreatic and she had, you know, she had loss of appetite. She felt super nauseous and the, whether it was her, the medical system, I mean, frankly, it's a medical system did not know how to attribute that. And unfortunately it was too late by the time they attributed it. The hope is that with genetic testing, right. you have enough of a portfolio to say, I am at risk for this thing. Please think about it when you're making your recommendations and your tests. Right, exactly. The knowledge is power in that case. And exactly. I think that makes me a little bit less scared but also, I, I mean, I haven't had I a hope test. So. No, I <laughs> hope so. Hi, BB. Look at her eyes. Holy shit. She's my, she's my fat cat, but she also, can, she doesn't have a tail. I love her. She's a, she's a manx, so she just naturally doesn't have a tail. And she is far less grumpy than the other one. She'll just sit here and hang out forever. She's a girl's girl. Oh, apparently not. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, kidding. She's like, fuck off, mom. Like, I don't want to be on YouTube. Um, no, I think that's true. And I, I don't know. I mean, like, the idea of mortality is obviously scary no matter what age. And I don't feel like I'm braver than anybody else. I don't feel like, I mean, maybe, I feel like I'm, I'm informed based on what I know about my own risks. There is more that I could do that I probably need to do, and it's kind of on my to, it's on my to do list. Um, and I think that you know people being fearful of, I guess that I don't understand that when people are scared of getting medical tests done. Um, and I, I also don't understand that, and I think that is a lack of empathy in myself. But I do not. For me, it's very rational. But that said, I would not get an MRI until my partner basically forced me. So, right. And so it's, it's like, you don't even realize that you're avoiding it yeah. until you have, and it's right. been like four years. It's like, oh, right. I'm not dying. Why would I no, ever get that? Right. Like, you know, excuse me, you know what I mean? So like, yeah, I don't know. I guess it's, oh yeah, someone said Stumpy Kitty. Thank you, Andrew. She is a Stumpy Kitty. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess it's like the kind of thing that like maybe my parents are like really realistic about it. Matter of fact, like obviously like my dad, I think that he, like, we don't talk about it in terms of like specific emotions. Like, I think So that's a, that's a question that I personally have. Do you guys talk about his illness? I mean, we talk about it in a matter of fact way. I mean, it's not like the elephant in the room where we don't speak of it. I think like, I don't, my dad and I don't have like long conversations in which I say like, how are you feeling emotionally? Yeah. I think that like, the you think audience, that's on, on you or him or just 
a, a matter of fact. Maybe that- both, maybe more so on him. Like, I, I think that obviously, like, you know, like my mom says, like, he doesn't want to die. Like, the idea of dying is fucking scary. Like, no one wants to, like, you know, you think that, you think about mortality as some far off, like, far away thing in your face with something. So he's staring down the barrel of something and it's very scary and isolating. There's some, there, I can't understand it because I'm not going through it and I haven't gone through it. My mom has, so, you know, even though that she's already his spouse and he can confide in her, they have that added layer of understanding because she's gone through it. Um, or, or some version of it, obviously. Like she didn't go through chemo like my dad is, um, but she obviously had really serious cancer. Um, and so like, we don't talk about it as much from an emotional perspective. And realistically, it's because I think like in my household and my dad will says when we do talk about it emotionally, he says like, this sucks, but we are going to do everything in our power. We're going to do everything that science can afford us in terms of treating it. Sure. Um, you know, do right you now, think it would be different if they didn't have the relationship that they did? Maybe. I think that he would probably feel more isolated, right? Like, you know, I... Yeah. So like I have, you know, the only way that I know how to explain it is like I have really, cr- I have chronic migraine and they're really debilitating and I have a really supportive spouse and I have a really supportive, like my mom and my stepdad are really supportive, um, but they don't, they don't experience it. So it's kind of like, I'm telling them what my experiences are and there's still a layer of differentiation because they don't really understand. Do you know right. what I mean? And that's right. much yeah. lighter. Like no, I totally different. get it light years different. So I, I feel like, you know, as much as I empathize and as supportive as I can be, there's still always like that slight, and I, this is not speaking on me. I haven't said, Hey dad, do you feel, do you feel this way? Like, it seems like it, there would be that slight feeling of isolation if no one in your immediate circle or if no one in your circle has had that experience. And so like, I feel like maybe um, him and my mom having like, you know, he went through some of these fears you know, when my mom had cancer and now the tables are turned so he can understand he, he, he is now the patient. So he experiences that he experiences it in a different way, but he yeah. also like understands some of the things that she is maybe feeling now kind yeah. of, and it's just like better. It's just communication through like it, it's empathy versus sympathy, I guess. Sure. No, whichever one is like, yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah. Sorry. I'm mixing yeah, no, words. no, it totally yeah. makes sense. And so, yeah, I don't know. I guess I feel like um, we deal with a lot of things. And some people would say it's cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dis- dissonance. Sorry, I'm like slurring my words now just because I can't, too many S's. Um, I deal with most things in life through humor. Like I saw in the comments, someone said, oh, like bad experiences and trauma basically give us something, some, something plus you like a dark. Someone said that? What was it's that? Hard. It, someone said that in our comment section yeah it wasn't a bad comment they were just saying that like having bad experiences gives you the added perspective of like like maybe more empathy but it also can result in like a, a, a dark sense of humor and like a we deal in my family with things through humor like we sure sometimes make jokes about alzheimer's because we know it's something that could affect our lives in a, in a traumatic way and so like there's nothing we can really do about it. And so it's just kind of thing is like, as opposed to drowning in the fear, it's just like, it's, it's just in the room. What do we, how do we, na- what is the best way to navigate around this elephant in the room? We're not going to ignore it, right. you know? And that's just the way that like, I guess I was raised to do yeah. it. And I'm not sure, like that's yeah. not the best for everybody. And I don't mean, you know, and I would feel horrible if someone said that like that, method made them feel diminished or less important that's just the way that I manage it I suppose do you know what I yeah. mean no of course no that makes total sense uh um, some people don't want to talk about it at all and that's fine too well I think unfortunately science gives you the tools to be able to have really difficult conversations right um right or fortunately right like it's how you look at it and right. I don't think either of us want to think about death Neither of us want to think about our, our dads dying. Right. Um, yeah. But we are able to have those conversations and able to really deal with um, their treatment yeah. because of science. And so I think a, a certain literacy in that is helpful. Yeah. No, I think it gives you a completely different sort of uh not only experience, but a, a different relationship with what is going on. 
It definitely does. I mean, I, my parents have asked me to go to like medical appointments because right. like, oh, you're good with that stuff. And I feel right. kind of like an imposter because like, oh, you understand genetics. And they no, want to talk different. about like, right. Right. like, oh, you want, they want to talk about like, you know, dad's like genetic mutation. I'm like, like this is not, yeah. it's genetics, but like, this is not my wheelhouse at all. So, I mean, I'm upfront about that, but like, you know, they're like, we want you to go so you can like ask questions to the doctor and stuff. And I, I'm still asking as an uninformed person, but like, yeah having that, having that knowledge of that, you know, I guess comprehension is obviously advantageous. And I think there is something to be said for scientists and, and people who know how to think analytically asking those questions and being those right. meanings and right. a scientific literacy is always something that I'm going to encourage everyone to have, have, mm-hmm. um, it's hard not only to engender, but to teach and right. to accept, um, right. but I think being in those positions where it's not just, is there quite, you know, something abstract that you can't really think about? Is there a, an asteroid going to hit earth or you right. know, is there climate change or whatever it is, at some point you have to think about data and at some point you have to try to understand what's going on Right. And having the tools to be able to dissect and to be able to analyze and talk about that is really important. Right. And I know my dad's oncologists in that situation were super grateful for the opportunity to talk to someone who got it. And I don't know anything about cancer. You know, I didn't at the time, but I was able to get the thinking behind, you know, exponential growth or whatever it is. Right. And not to like harp on why conversations like this are so important, but people, unfortunately, and and fortunately, because there are some really cool things that happen out of it, get to think about things that um, may be hard. And it's not just people getting sick, but it's exponential growth in ponds or across cats or you know a national park suddenly has 50 million I mean I know it's like a huge number but you know they have a certain number of cats we're like holy shit great we have an uh, an abundance of snow cats and let's talk about that we need you know, it how that happen yeah exactly um okay someone I'm asked sorry. a question yes no I love it no it's good What is the question? And then let's rapid fire and then end because my partner has to study for the GRE and I, I cannot monopolize. Yeah. Sorry. We took a, we took a, we, I love that we go down these rabbit holes though. I feel like it's just like organic conversation. It is. Um, someone said, here's a good question on the Slack. Any documentaries about your respective fields that you would recommend? Fuck. Um, unfortunately, and I, I have to ask or answer every documentary, movie, TV show, book question with this. Unfortunately, I have not found one that I really love other than Carl Sagan. And that is a problem that I need to reconcile, but I have a very hard time um, seeing questions that I love being answered in the way that I would answer in a way that I'm excited about. other than Carl Sagan, I mean. Well, just add it to your to-do list and make one you're doing yourself. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's like what's up. Let's take this documentary. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think there is room for that. I think that unfortunately there is an oversaturation of men. And I mean- Fucking A, that's the truth. <laughs> I believe that's part of the reason why I got a book deal is my, my literary agent was like, everyone is a man and I don't know how to read this and I was like I'm not I I can can answer that yeah I mean it sucks but it's true and I think unfortunately you know if I when I was an undergraduate going through this field I my only the only people I looked up to were men and people asked me who did who do you look up to and it fucking sucks because I don't have a good answer. Right. I say Carl Sagan, you know, I say Einstein or whoever it is. 
none of them are women and none of them are women of color. And partially part of that is on myself. You know, I didn't take the initiative to look out for, for people like that, but I also was not exposed to it. So no, but I mean, but yeah, we have to start somewhere. And I, I hate it when people say, actually, I just said the thing that I hate when people say, because it's like, Oh, like deal with all, suck it up and deal with all the bullshit of the past. Cause eventually it's going to get better. And that's obviously not always the case. That might not, right. that might not be the case, right. but I mean, there's no, there's no problem. I don't feel like there's something you should feel bad about saying I haven't been able to identify with a mentor that I feel like I can like wholly admire and look up to. Right. And, um, I, and I think that like what that means is that like whether it's conscious or not that a lot of your work is kind of hinged is, is ultimately developing into the idea that you were becoming, you are becoming the person that you needed when you were growing up exactly and that is something that I feel like uh transcends into a lot of the just who I am as a person and it's outside science it's just like I had some I had some bad things happen to me when I was a kid and I didn't have some of the things that I needed and it's like now as an adult like I have the opportunity to kind of like try to fill that I guess or like not gap but just like what is I keep dropping a nail what is what is it like what is who is or what is something that imaging could have used like as a child and like I'm going to go out and become her. So like someone else can have what they need. Yeah. But, you know, it doesn't have to be that deep. It just means like, you know, we need someone else other than Carl Sagan and we're going to go out and do it. Yeah, that's right. That's what it boils down to. And I think that's admirable and important because we need more people. We need more people in science to look like the rest of the world. Yes. And I don't think there's a lot of like, I don't, I can't think of really any wildlife documentaries about like my field um you know that's like explicitly about the field i suppose i mean like obviously things like you know planet earth and planet earth 2 have done a beautiful job and trying to get people excited about like nature and wildlife and stuff like that but like if you want to like really make something like more digestible something that i think that i love really recently is um what is is birds of north america it's a youtube video by my by um wild by ornithologist jason ward i'll make sure it's um, it is birds of north america with jason ward um it's a youtube it's rock it is amazing. Just want to make sure I'm not. It is bird. Yeah, sorry. Birds of North America with Jason Ward. It's free. It's on YouTube. It's amazing. I highly recommend it. I mean, he, you know, is taking people out and they're birding, and you learn about birds, you learn about people, you learn about the field. And I think it's just something that's just fucking cool, man. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> you know, so like, if you haven't watched that and you're thinking about becoming a biologist or you think nature is neat, definitely watch that. I highly recommend that. Okay. Uh, for the next two minutes, and I swear to God, I'm going to put a timer on for two minutes. Okay, we're going to answer many questions. We're going to answer as many questions as we can. And we're not we're good about answering questions, are we? Off because a <laughs> three hour sorry, deal, guys. which we are already close to, is insane. It's obscene. All right, um, so okay. we're going to teach each other to be better about okay. answering questions. Ready, Imogene? Okay. And go. All right, so here's a question What subject is your partner applying to graduate school for, Serafina? Business school. All right, let's see. Um, someone else ask us a question. Fuck. Blah, 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 blah. We have to scroll back up, which is hard. I'm watching like the chat. I know, me too. It's hard to answer. Um, all right, saw that. Uh... <laughs> Great reading. Feel... I can help. Great Sorry. reading can help out with difficult life circumstances. Do you have any recommendations? Um. You know, I read a really good fiction book uh, last year called Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens, who is actually a wildlife biologist. And I didn't know that when I got her book and it covers- That's some cool. It's a fucking good book. It's a great, the plot is fantastic. Is she on Twitter? Good stuff. Watch it. It's good. Or read it. Sorry, don't watch it. Read it. Is she on watch Twitter? It's not going to do anything. What? Is she on Twitter? I don't, oh, she must, Delia Owens might be on Twitter. We have one minute. Okay. Um, Okay. Waiting for questions if there are any. Fuck. I know. I'm trying know. to I'm scroll. I'm just gonna scroll, 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 right, scroll, scroll. Um I'm gonna I'm gonna give a shot at oh, what would the universe look like if gravity traveled less than the speed of light? I don't even know how to think about that. Um <sighs> fuck. So gravity is an acceleration. Um the speed of light is a velocity. So gravity is an acceleration. Is that um, me making things talk? The yes. speed no, of that's, light that's is me. a velocity. Okay. Uh, so gravity is an acceleration. Ah. Ah. Okay. 
make a meme of yourself yeah no i i got it <laughs> um right so there are two different two different quantities if you talk about a speed you were talking about the speed of light if you're talking about the gravity you were talking about an acceleration and so to try to understand how things work you have to reconcile the two and that's hard that is you know why movies like interstellar exist you have to understand the acceleration of a wormhole or a black hole or whatever it is i am so sorry this is the past two hours which is why i'm getting slack slack notifications um can you classify supernova spectra using deep learning yes yes you absolutely can that is one of the things i'm working on what, fun fact that i find fun I am trying to understand which supernova spectra slash light curves um, correspond to very like various variable stars. So it could be a Betelgeuse like star that's going to die, or it could be a Cepheid that just like does this throughout its whole lifetime, and you don't know which part of life it's you're picking up when you look at it. Or it could be a supernova literally about to explode and you're like, fuck, I got some spectra, let's see it. So you're trying to understand, okay, I have some variable like things. Let me try to constrain it to the specific object that I think it is affiliated with. Okay, I like it. I see three questions that are cool since we're dialing down. Uh, imaging, what's your favorite thing about big cats? Um, I love that big cats are wide ranging. They have large home ranges and large distributions, which means they have to do a lot. They have to expend a lot of energy in order to meet their resource needs, which consequently makes them really tied to every other part of an ecosystem, which means that they're A, cool, and B, they're ecosystem indicators. Um, let's see. Uh, Serafina saw a question uh, that you can maybe answer. What do you think is going to explode first, Yellowstone or Beetlejuice? <laughs> Probably Yellowstone. Probably Yellowstone, right? <laughs> Another good question. Uh, why are bobcats so, no, sorry. Why are bobcats so difficult in hybridization with other cats? I'm not sure what you mean. Like bobcats uh, have hybridized with Canada lynx, but I'm not sure if there's like a. Do you mean like? If you mean uh, in terms of like people having domestic cats with hybrids like crossing servals and caracals with domestic cats, I don't know the answer to that. Um, there's a cool question, Serafina and Imogene. Uh, if you were not inter if you were not into your science, what other discipline of science would you be uh, in? I don't know. Do you know? I would, yeah, I'd be a medical pathologist. I just would just want to cut up dead people. I think probably physics. Although I, I don't like solving physics problems, I think it'd probably be physics. I like trying to understand how things work, like very profoundly. I get right. it. I'd like it. Yes. Well, that's why I would be a pathologist, because I would want to understand how things work, like the insides. But the cool thing about like medical pathology is that the person's already dead, so you don't have the pressure of killing them you like you would think if you were a surgeon. That is the most like the most zero degree thing about science is trying to understand how things work from yeah. any scale yeah it, do you Just think curiosity. that's engineering though say it again do you think that's engineering or science it, is engineering it? like making things and science is figuring out how things work i don't know i mean I is think there an engineer here i don't what is engineering? <laughs> All right, I have to let my partner study in two seconds. One last question, Imogene, what is it? Um, make it a series, yes. It's true, yes, and they're already dead. It's not like I can make it anywhere. So I'm reading up, I'm reading up. Someone is, they're talking about food trucks right now, which I'm really distracted by. Um, <laughs> all right, is, is the universe being pushed apart, uh, pushed apart by dark matter or is dark matter stretching it and making it bigger? Uh, neither. The universe is being pushed apart by dark energy. Dark matter, dark matter is just a symptom of that happening. So dark matter is along for the ride, just like any other matter. Large stars, galaxies, whatever it is, dark matter gets pushed along and um, the space between dark matter and other things expands alongside the universe. 
We need another session of this because there's a lot Stop of things this that we don't know about stars. I don't know. Okay. Clearly we need our own show because this is already two and a half hours and more than two and a half hours. Um, I mean, right. do, does that mean we segue from drunk science? Like obviously you're doing that, but like, like <laughs> yes. I think maybe yes. All right. We'll talk about this outside of YouTube so your, okay. so your partner can study. Last it. thing you have to say, go for it. Um, you can find me on the internet. You can find me on social media on Twitter at biologist IMO, which uh, we'll just type it in right now. Um, or you can also find me on Instagram, which is how I got started, which is a uh, biologist image. Really? That's how you yeah, got that's how I got started. That's how I get like all I get all of these interviews for like TV shows, wow. and stuff, like uh, media type things. And it's all because of uh, stuff I started doing on Instagram. So if you want to find me on those, you totally can and we'll hang out. It'll be fun. Imogene is amazing. Thank you so much for joining me slash us on this amazing show that I would happily watch by myself alone. Um, we'll do it again, guys. guys for, for tuning in. Um, we will probably form our own show together. It works. Seraphine is the best, obviously, but you guys already all know that. We're so. your best friends. All right, guys. Have a great Friday night. We love y'all. Have a good night. Good night. Bye.